from hand rolling 100,000 bagels every week in New York City to feeding 100,000 people at the Gurudwara Bangla Sahib Temple in India. We traveled the globe to uncover the amazing stories behind the world's biggest batches of food. Our first stop is Utopia Bagels in Whitestone, New York. This 200-pound mountain of dough will soon be hand-rolled into 1,000 bagels, just a small fraction of the 100,000 bagels made at this shop every week. Workers start the baking process at 3 a.m. and continue way past lunch hours. But according to owner Scott Spellman, the guarantee of a fresh, hot bagel is why Utopia Bagels stands out from the thousands of other stores across New York City. I say it time and time again. You may have tried a bagel, but once you try my bagel, you will not eat another bagel. We visited Utopia's kitchen in Queens, New York, to see how it prepares its bagels in such big batches. It all starts with a 41-year-old dough recipe that uses barley mold. It's a really old school way of doing a bagel. Most stores that make bagels today use brown sugar, but to make a good quality bagel, you need this ingredient. Next, they add salt and a large scoop of Puratus Bagel Improver. So what that does, it softens the dough inside and it crisps the crust outside. Then they start filling the mixer with New York City tap water, but it has to be at just the right temperature. We tend to use water that's around 60 degrees, 62, 63, but temperatures of the water may change when it's hotter and colder throughout the year. Then it's time to add in 200 pounds of all-purpose flour, a small portion compared to what they have on hand. You're looking at about 7,000 pounds of flour. Almost a two-day amount for us that will go through all this flour. And this is actually just one of my mountains of flour. The final ingredient is yeast. But for flavored bagels, the recipe may change slightly to include eggs, sugar, or freeze-dried blueberries, depending on the flavor. There is no set time for when the dough is finished mixing. According to Scott, it takes a keen eye and years of experience. It's a thing called when it's ready. <laughs> How long have you been making bagels? 18 years. 18 years. Daniel's been rolling 18 years. It takes understanding the temperature in the air. It takes understanding his machine that he works with, how long it should mix. All these things are such important factors about what happens with our bagel. Once the dough reaches the desired consistency, it's cut into sections and transferred over to the rolling table, where it's then formed into one large mound. We can make up to 15,000 bagels in a day, and this will make approximately 1,000 bagels. They cover the entire thing with a plastic sheet to help soften the dough before rolling. And it's only about a five minute process that allows that dough to connect a little better with each other. They're saying, hello, how are you? All those ingredients are basically doing that right now. At any given point, there are four expert rollers on hand. These skilled men have between 15 and 27 years of experience perfecting their craft, something Scott says is a dying breed. There's not a school of rolling bagels out there right now. And these people are experts at their field. Listen, I think Derek Jeter said it best. If you put 10,000 hours into something, you're a professional. And Daniel has definitely put 10,000 hours into it. It takes an hour to an hour and a half for these hand rollers to individually slice, roll, and twist about a thousand bagels. It takes a certain type of character because it's very tedious. You're cutting the same thing over and over. And I can tell who is rolling what bagel by the way they lock their bagel and form it together. Daniel has that little lip here that I noticed about Daniel's rolling, and then I can see, you know, those were Daniel's bagels. 
and it gives each bagel their own personality. Our bagels are like snowflakes. Everyone is individually different, and that's what makes it special. Once the bagels are rolled, they're placed on these racks, covered with plastic and left to proof for a half hour. They then move into one of three fridges to ferment for at least 24 hours. What we're going to do now is open these bagels up because we still have to reduce the heat to stop the rising of these bagels. We tend to stop the proofing where a lot of places tend to expand their proofing so that bagels are bigger. There's a misconception that bigger bagels are better and they're not by far. As you see, each rack has approximately a thousand bagels. So you're looking at 10,000, 15,000 bagels right before your eyes. And this is only one of my fridges that we keep the bagels. Here's my second fridge. Again, you have racks of bagels, one, two, three, four. We have close to seven, 8,000 more bagels. So this is basically where we'll keep our everyday making of the bagels. Now it's time for fun and games. We're gonna start baking some bagels. We'll always have two people working the oven. So there's a kettle man, which we'll call him. So he'll control the flow of the bagels into the kettle. And then there's the guy on the oven that will be his director. But the kettle is the ultimate guy in control because he knows when that bagel's ready to come out of that kettle. It's so important. Once the bagels have been properly boiled, they're scooped over to boards that have been pre-seasoned with the appropriate flavors, such as poppy, sesame, or the very popular everything mix. Now are these hot? Yes, they are very hot. But if you watch me, I'm constantly dipping my hand in water to remove some of that heat. Now this again is where we put on both sides. So we're seasoning both boards, both sides. After workers carefully coat each bagel, they move the boards into the oven. Now, why we're putting them on boards? Because if we put these bagels in straight, they would stick to the slate that they're being cooked on. We put six bagels on a board. There's 16 boards that'll go into the oven. We have a Middleby Marshall, a 1947 oven. It is the heart and soul of my business. We're able to produce up to a thousand bagels an hour on it. After a few rotations around the oven, the boards are flipped so the bottom of the bagels can cook evenly. Then they're ready to be pulled and served to customers. See, these are so, look at it, look at the color on this bagel. Look at that beautiful crisp crust. My son always does the knock test, but feel that crisscross? Look at that steam coming out of that bagel. In total, Utopia Bagels offers 30 kinds of bagels and various sandwiches like the bacon, egg and cheese, or the classic blocks. 43 staff members make up Utopia Bagels, and they all work like a well-oiled machine to serve the 3,500 customers who visit the shop every week. We're busiest on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. We could have a line lasting for eight hours straight. But you get me crying about my customers because our fan base is like none other. It's like a landmark. Everybody's been coming here for over 50 years. It's the, like a home place for everybody. It's the atmosphere, it's the people, it's the owner. Everybody's so nice here. And when you come in, you feel welcomed. Everything is good. I've been around to other bagel stores, but there's no place like home. Scott treats you like family when you come here. Utopia Bagels is the best. The most important thing about our bagels is right here. And I get emotional about it, but it's the heart and soul. Every worker here has heart and soul. It truly is something I live for and something we work at. You know, 
my passion for making people smile with our food and what we produce is a joy for me. It really is. Oh yeah, those are the everything bagels coming out. Look at those colors. This is the Gurudwara Bangla Sahib Temple in New Delhi, India. Open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, the temple's kitchen or langar feeds 35,000 to 40,000 people every day for free. And on religious holidays, that number can swell to well over 100,000 people. At the heart of this entire operation is kitchen manager Habej Singh, who makes sure there is always enough to eat. Kabhi bhi koi aaye, koi raat ke do baje aaye. Aisa din koi nahi ra ke koi Bangla chef se bhuka gaya ho. To keep up with demand, the kitchen uses specialized machines that can do everything from chopping vegetables and stirring stews to steaming the perfect dal. We visited the temple during a special holiday called Gurpurab to see how it makes a festive meal in such big batches. The day begins with making a type of sweet rice pudding called kheer, which is a special menu addition for Gurpurab. At the helm of the operation is head chef Balbir Singh, who's been overseeing this process for years. Large bags of white rice are poured into metal bowls and washed by hand. 25 kilograms of the washed rice is then scooped into a massive pot of water and mixed by a mechanical arm. Once the pot has been filled with milk and it starts to boil, they pour in a large bag of wheat flour. During the pandemic, the kitchen found itself needing to make more food with less stuff. The solution was to introduce pots that could automatically stir and cook most dishes in half the time. So, we have set up a system in the past few days, we can provide a lot of people in one hour. So, in the past few days, we have to take a lot of people in the past few days, we have to take a lot of people in the past few days. We have to take a lot of people in the past few days. While the kitchen has embraced technology for cooking, many of the vegetables the kitchen uses are still processed by hand. One of the most popular dishes the community kitchen makes is aloo matar, a curry dish made with potatoes, peas and a creamy tomato sauce. Making this dish begins with heating vegetable oil in a pot as a base for the tadka. As we make gravy in the house, we add peas, tomatoes, adrag, lassan, plus masala, jeera, kali mirch, degi mirch, kitchen king, kasuri methi, and we add all the vegetables in the kitchen king, kasuri methi, and we add all the vegetables in the kitchen king, kasuri methi, and we add all the vegetables in the kitchen king, kasuri methi. This is followed by baskets of potatoes, peas, and large ladles of tomato puree. In one hour, we add 200 kilo aloo and 60 kilo matar. When the dish is ready, chefs tip the pot and scrape everything out. Another curry dish the kitchen serves for the holiday feast is Kadi Chawal, which is made with a base of cumin, masala and dried fenugreek leaves. When the base is mixed, chefs add gram flour and hung curd. इसके अंदर हमारा 15 से 20 किलो बेसन लगता है और 30 से 40 किलो मतलब कि दही लगता है. While the kadi mixes, chefs prepare the final part of the dish on the side. They mix spinach, onions, gram flour and spices in a large pot to make pakodas or fritters. When they achieve the right consistency, the mix is then tossed into a wok and fried quickly. 
These fritters are then added into the curry. ये मतलब ये भी 300-400 किलो इसमें कंप्लीट कड़ी बनती है। Next up, the kitchen is making aloo gobi, a simple vegetarian dish made with potatoes and cauliflower. It starts with a tatka base of cumin, turmeric and chili powder. Then the chefs add in baskets of cauliflower and potatoes. They mix everything together to evenly coat the veggies and continue stirring until they are finished cooking. An everyday staple on the langar's menu is fresh dal, or split lentils. Green, yellow and brown lentils are all washed by hand daily and added into a pot full of water. The lentils are then seasoned with salt, chili powder and turmeric and covered. We have 5 cookers in our house. We have 60-70 kg ये सारा ऑटोमेटिक है जब दाल कंप्लीट हो जाती है ये बजर बजने लग चालू हो जाता है कि दाल कंप्लीट हो गई है इसमें भी बहुत टाइमिंग कम लगती है जैसे दाल को दो से तीन घंटे लगते हैं इसमें आधे से पौना घंटा लगता है इतनी जल्दी बनती है और इतनी टाइमिंग कम लगती है ना कि जितनी संगत आ जाए लाखों के हिसाब से संगत आती है कभी लंगर की कभी कमी नहीं हुई जिसको बन, कंप्लीट बनने के बाद दाल साढ़े तीन सौ किलो होती है Across the kitchen, flatbreads are made using machines. उसके बाद ये हमारी मशीन रोटी मेकर जो एक घंटे में 2000 प्रसादे बनाती है और कंप्लीट ऑटोमेटिक है सब कुछ इसमें पेड़े आटा सब ओनली आटा गुन्ना पड़ता है हमारे को गुन के इसके अंदर डालेंगे कटिंग पेड़ा सब इसी ने करना है उसके बाद ये देखो ओ ये रोटी कंप्लीट होके अप डाउन अप डाउन तीन राउंड में बाहर है वाल दिस मशीन्स मेक अ मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द ब्रेड द लंगार यूजेस देयर इज अनदर एरिया ऑफ द किचन डेडिकेटेड टू मेकिंग दिस ब्रेड्स बाय हैंड दिस इज डन सो पीपल कैन प्रैक्टिस सीवा और सेल्फ लव सर्विस अ टेनेट ऑफ सिकिज्म जो संगत आती है जिनकी श्रद्धा होती है कि हमने भी गुरुद्वारा बंगला साहब में सेवा करनी है तो वो यहाँ पे आके मैनुअल सेवा कर सकता है 24 घंटे चलती है जब भी किसी श्रद्धा हो कर सकती है लंगर ऑफिशियली ओपन इट्स डोर्स एट फाइव ए एम टू सर्व फूड तो आप देखोगे गुरुपुर का दिन है आज गुरुपुरब चल रहा है और ये पूरी ऑल ओवर वर्ल्ड में मनाया जाता है इसी तरह आज गुरुद्वारा बंगला साहब में भी मनाया जा रहा है तो लाखों में लोग आएंगे बिकॉज ऑफ द किचन पॉपुलरिटी इट्स नॉट अनकॉमन फॉर पीपल टू वेट टू एंड हाफ आवर्स आउटसाइड टू गेट अ फ्री मील इन साइड द डाइनिंग हॉल विजिटर्स टेक देर सीट्स साइड बाय साइड इन लॉन्ग रोज नोन एज पंग This style of seating is an important part of the temple's philosophy of promoting equality and ending discrimination. So, जहाँ पे राजा भी आए, उसको भी उतना ही समानता दी जाती है और एक बुखारी को भी उतनी समानता दी जाती है. Once everyone is seated, volunteers, known as sibaders, lead a religious chant in honor of the guru. Then the servers come around spooning large portions of food into metal plates. And while the amount of food one can eat is unlimited, there is a rule that not a single bite of food can be wasted. So plates must be cleaned before finishing the meal. Langar ki khasiyat to yahi hai ki wo langar hai, prashad hai. Usko aap as a meal nahi le sakte, ye ek guru ka prashad hota hai. और इसमें हर पार्टी बेस्ट है कोई भी इसमें कोई कमी ना होती है ना होनी चाहिए और ये बेस्ट है अपने में हर चीज अच्छी है When a batch of guests has finished eating workers sweep and wash the floors before another group is allowed to enter और साफ सफाई का पूरा पूरा ध्यान दिया जाता है ताकि साफ सुथरा रहे 
सकते हैं हमारी कोशिश यही रहती है कि सबको साफ सुथरा हाइजीनिक और गर्म लंगर तैयार करके दिया जाए मैं बंगला साहब काफ़ी बचपन से आ रहा हूँ लगभग बीस साल बीस चौबीस साल हो गए जितनी मेरी एज है खाना साफ सुथरा था और काफ़ी आज क्या था कि नॉर्मली क्या होता है कि दाल चावल रोटी मिलती है नॉर्मली देखा जाए तो नॉर्मली डेज पे बट आज क्या जैसे बैसाखी होती है आज थर्टी फर्स्ट भी है तो आज गुरु की कृपा से हमें पनीर भी मिला खीर भी मिली और ये देखो कि ऐसा नहीं है कि स्पेशली कुक है कि एक ही बंदा आके बना रहा है ऐसा नहीं है कोई भी धर्म का बंदा आके कोई भी सेवा कर सकता है उसकी मन में सेवा भावना होनी चाहिए और सेवा से क्या होता है कि दिल में एक भावना जागती है उस अकाल पूरक के लिए फिर हम उसके आगे फिर हमारा अंदर से बनता है Every week these three chefs make 10,000 meals by hand. Working 10-hour shifts, the chefs use specialized cast iron and steel pots that can cook 800 servings at a time. Today the kitchen is making 1,200 mapo tofu lunch boxes and every meal comes with rice, krag egg soup, chili chapche, pickled radishes, cucumber and chive salad. still fried garlic scapes and chinese flower buns it's a tall order but worth the effort according to head chef hyo chun 물론 가끔 힘들 때도 있지만 고객님께서 맛있게 먹었다는 소리에 저희가 힘이 나고 열심히 하고 있습니다 we visited muka doshirak to see how this kitchen prepares its lunch boxes in such big batches The process begins at 4:30 a.m. when Ochun and his team start prepping ingredients for the day's menu. Chefs begin by washing and cutting 40 kg of white onions and 20 kg of green onions for the mapu tofu. 장난 아니게 너무 양파가 좀 많이 매운 편이라 이렇게 좀 많이 눈물을 흘려요, 지금. 이만큼 요리사들이 좀 많이 힘들어요. 그 크기에 맞아야지 도시락에 들어가서 예쁜 모양을 낼수 있기 때문에 그 크기로 잘하고 있습니다. Next, carrots are peeled, cut, and added into the same container as the white onions. Once the vegetables are prepped, it's time to start unpacking the tofu. 하루에 40판 정도 입고가 됩니다. 입고 되는 걸 3명에서 제로 손질을 하고 있습니다. 이걸로 약 도시락 1,500개 정도 예상하고 있습니다. The tofu is cut into cubes and loaded into metal trays, which are then wheeled into a large steamer. 아무래도 깨질 경우가 많으니까 저희가 쪄서 조리를 하게 되었습니다. While the tofu is steaming, chefs start cooking the other ingredients for the dish in a large cast iron wok. They add red pepper oil and stir fry the green onions and 10 kg of pork together until the meat cooks through. <laughs> Chefs then add in the basket of white onions and carrots as well as large ladles of doubanjang. a savory chinese bean paste made from fermented broad beans chili peppers and soy bean they season the mixture and add ladles of starch water to help adjust the consistency finally once the tofu is done it's drained and mixed into the wok using a metal shovel And that's not the only thing that's custom in the kitchen. Chefs use a special machine that supplies and drains water to wash about 120 kilograms of rice at a time. 쌀은 총세번 씻고요. 기계는 스물한 대가 있고요. 개수로 그 다음에 약 900인분 정도 네, 이렇게 나오고 있습니다. 한 솥에 50분, 50인분이 나오고요. 
그 다음에 소요 시간은 밥이 전원을 누르고 동시에 30분 정도 뒤에 밥이 완료가 됩니다 물량은 쌀에 한 80% 정도 물량을 맞추고 있습니다 아무래도 80%다 생각하고 하면 부족하기 때문에 저희가 손을 넣어서 그렇게 물을 잡고 있습니다 물량은 손에 손가락 끝나는 부분까지 저희가 물량을 잡아서 그렇게 조리를 하고 있습니다 The next order of business is making chili c h a p c h e 고추 잡채는 고기 20kg, 피망 10kg, 파프리카 20kg, 양파 10kg, 굴소스 3kg, 설탕 1kg, 그 다음에 후추 500g 이렇게 들어가고 있습니다. 고추기름에 고기를 볶다가 그 다음에 야채, 야채 넣고 센 불에 볶다가 가진 양념을 넣고 빠르게 마무리하면 됩니다. 고추 잡채 같은 경우에는 1시간 20분 정도 소요가 됩니다. 절인 이유는 고객들에게 음식이 갔을 때 물이 흐끈하지 하지 않기 위해서 저희가 절여서 지금 제공하고 있습니다 음식을. 절인, 절인 다음에 물기를 완전히 제거하지 않으면 다시 물기가 생겨서 지금 완전히 물기를 제거한 후에 양념을 넣어서 버무려서 나가고 있습니다. 오이가 40kg, 달래가 10kg, 그 다음에 물엿 300g, 설탕 600g, 간장 600g, 그 다음에 멸치 액젓 100g, 참기름 100g 네, 이렇게 들어가고 있습니다. 1시간 10분 정도 소요가 되고 있습니다. 지금 많은 쫑 깨무침을 준비하고 있어요. 그래서 지금 데치고 있는 중이고요. 네, 지금 데쳐서 지금 나오고 있는 상태입니다. 지금 꺼내서 간장 900g, 설탕 600g, 물엿 300g, 마늘 300g, 참기름 200g 이렇게 졸여서 전문 쳐서 같이 묻혀서 나가고 있습니다. 게살 계란탕에 게, 계란 20판 게살 20kg, 그 다음에 팽이버섯 20kg, 참기름 200g, 굴소스 300g, 소금, 소금은 일단 계산 계란국에는 육수를 먼저 내고요. 육수에는 멸치, 디포리 이렇게 넣어서 육수를 볶고요. 끓으면 다 건져내서 안에 계란이랑 넣어서 농도를 먼저 잡고요. 전분으로. 전부는 농도 잡고 게살이랑 핑이버섯 이렇게 넣어서 마무리 하고 있습니다. 게살 계란국은 끓이는 시간까지 포함해서 2시간 정도 소요가 됩니다. For dessert, the chefs are reheating flour buns. 꽃빵 1000개 필요하고요. 꽃빵은 저희한테 냉동 상태로 입고가 돼서 다음 날 기름에 튀겨서 Once fried, the buns will be drizzled with condensed milk and topped with almonds. When everything is cooked, employees fill small individual containers with rice and crab egg soup. 
and scoop portions of the other six dishes into a divided tray. Each of these lunch boxes cost 7,000 won or about $5. After 10 hours of cooking and packaging, the lunch boxes are then put into insulated containers and delivered to offices around the city that have subscriptions. Well, it's not bad, but I think the Mapadu is not bad. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. 배달해서 먹을 수 있다는 게 좋은 것 같습니다. This restaurant preps, packs, and roasts hundreds of kilos of meat every day to make delicious donor. Peshenek Donor in Turkey has been serving its namesake dish for over 45 years. Across three branches in Ankara, the restaurant chain can prepare up to one and a half tons of meat every single day to feed over 1,500 customers. We visited one of its kitchens to see how cooks prepare Donor in such big batches. It starts with the meat which owner Kazim Peshenek sources specifically from the hind legs of dairy calves from the Kadzil Kahaman district in Ankara. Yani bizim döner kebap için e, en iyi kısım süt danasının arka butu. Zaten arka but olması çok önemli. Özellikle de genç danalar yani yaklaşık 1 yaşında civarında genç danaların zaten etin renginden de belli olur. Pembe olur, esmer olmaz. Yaşlı danalardaki esmer olur. Kitchen staff use these special knives that are thin and long to slice the large portions of meat into thin, flat pieces. Yani normal bir mutfak bıçağı tam mümkün değil. Yani bu butlar tek tek tek tek ustalar tarafından aşağıda kesiliyor. Workers fill this entire table with meat, then salt it and cover it with the house marinade. Yani günlük şubelerimizde her şubede yaklaşık 500 kilo, yarım ton civarında et marine ediyoruz. Yani etin marinesinin içerisinde soğan suyu, süt veya süt ürünleri, ayran, yoğurt vesaire gibi bir de yüzde bir oranında da tuz kullanıyoruz. They massage the meat to make sure each piece is generously coated. Once they've finished the marinade process, they neatly pack the seasoned slabs of meat into these metal containers. They cover the meat in plastic and move it to the fridge, where it rests for two days for the flavors to melt and the meat to tenderize. Once the meat is fully rested, it's time to start assembling the shish. The process starts at 9 a.m. and it takes about two hours for cooks to stack around 250 kilos of meat. For extra flavor and richness, they also add layers of tail fat. Daha sonra şey takacağımız zaman da yüzde 10-12 civarında kuyruk yağı kullanıyoruz. Parça şeklinde ağza gelmesin diye kıyma şeklinde hem ara katlara hem en üst kata kuyruğun yağını almış oluyorsunuz ve lezzetini almış oluyorsunuz ama parça şeklinde özellikle bazı kimseler sevmezler, yemezler. Throughout the stacking process, workers repeatedly push down on the layers to keep air out and shave off the outer pieces of meat to shape the donor into an inverted cone. These shavings get added back into the stack with the tail fat so nothing is wasted. 
For the final layer, workers flatten the remaining tail fat into a sheet that perfectly covers the top of the stack. Then it's time to light the broiler and let the donor cook for 4 to 5 hours. 15-20 dakika ilk o içini çekme tabir ediyoruz dönerde. İlk yüzü ısınıyor. Ondan sonra servise normal başlayabiliyoruz. The lunch rush usually lasts from 12 p.m. to 1:30 p.m. In this hour and a half span, the restaurant serves 500 to 600 customers. Yani her gün günlük yaklaşık bir buçuk ton civarında döner satışımız var. Because of donor's special cooking method, orders can be ready in as little as five minutes. Dünyanın en hızlı yemeği hem hızlı bir şekilde pişecek, hem hızlı bir şekilde kesilecek. Yani insan için dik bir şekilde en ideal hızlı bir şekilde kesmesi için. The restaurant cooks a new separate donor for the evening rush. While this ensures the freshness that customers value, it also caters to customers' varying preferences of the donor. E, bu dönerin şimdi farklı yönleri var. Kimisi ilk tıraşını sever, yani biraz daha tuzlu olur. Ama kimisi de görüntüsü de güzel olsun, yaprak olsun adına yani dönerin daha ortalarında. Ben daha önce dönerin ilk kesim halini de denedim. O da güzel. Yani sırf onun için gelenler de var çok erken saatte ama. Ben daha çok e, akşam saatlerine kalmadan yani daha sulu olduğu zamanlarda, etin suyunu daha fazla olduğu zamanlarda, etin daha yumuşak olduğu zamanlarda tercih ediyorum. Doner has existed in different forms and under various names in the Middle East for ages. But the ready to cut vertical version we see today is believed to have been created in the mid 19th century in Bursa, Turkey by Iskander Efendi. The doner kebab is not Turkey's national dish, but it is among the country's most popular foods. Every day, 900,000 kilograms of traditional kebab is eaten across the country. And although rice and salad are some of the most common additions to this popular street food across the world, according to Kazim, Kebabı, döner kebabını yemenin en iyi yolu Beşinek doner makes his lavash with a simple dough recipe of white flour, salt, yeast and water. Once it's been properly mixed, the pieces are shaped, flattened, topped with an egg yolk marinade and finally cooked in a stone oven, heated by a wood fire. Each lavash is timed so that it bakes in the same time frame as the donor. Babamın bir tabiri vardır. Lavaş bizde e, döner mesela üç tane sipariş gelir, üç tane lavaş çıkar. Once the lavaş is cut and plated, cooks top the slices with 140 grams of donor and savory bibaş, a grilled spicy pepper that is traditionally served with roast or grilled meat throughout Turkey. Small plates of sumac onions and fresh salad are also served as sides or additional toppings. Bence mükemmel ısırık. Pidenizin arasına eti koyduğunuz zaman üstüne biraz biber ekledikten sonra soğanı koyup aldığınız o ilk ısırık en güzel ısırığınız oluyor. Bunun tam kıvamında ayarlıyor peçenek, ekmeğini buranın. İdeal incelikte, yenildiği zamanda parçalanmayan bir şekilde. Ekmeğini bu şekilde tarif edebilirim. By the end of the meal, many customers are still hungry for dessert. Yani bazı müşterilerimiz var hatta şöyle tabir ediyor. Biz dönerim sütlaca altlık olsun diye yiyoruz. The recipe for Peşenek Donor's rice pudding, also known as sütlak, took four months to perfect. It starts with the milk from Jersey cows, which is boiled with sugar and Osman Şik rice for over two hours to reach this thick, creamy consistency. Sütlaçta da benim için önemli olan nokta o sütün kokusunu, tadını alabilmem lazım. Yine aynı şekilde etteki gibi rahatsız etmeyecek olması lazım. Cooks bake the pudding in a water bath inside the same wood fired oven used for lavash. Ya bir katkı maddesi olmasın. Yani bir eskiden çok eskilerden annelerimizin köyde yaptığı sütlaç gibi olsun. İnsanları aradığı bir lezzeti sunalım diye. Bura yıllardır geldiğimiz için artık buraya güveniyoruz. Etlerinin sağlıklı ve temiz olduğunu biliyoruz. Çalışanların güler yüzü Bizi kapıda gördükleri zaman samimi bir şekilde karşılamalar da bizi buraya çeken etkenlerden biri.
This mega kitchen in Japan carefully prepares 3,000 school meals every day. Since 1967, the Musashino City School Lunch and Dietary Education Promotion Foundation has been cooking these meals to promote healthy eating habits among young children. We visited its kitchen, Sakura Tsutsumi Cookhouse, to see how these lunches are made in such big batches. The day's preparation starts around 7.30 each morning. Staff members change into sanitized factory shoes and color-coded uniforms and wash their hands twice before entering the kitchen. This is Takagi. He is the nutritionist in charge of the menu and he is our tour guide for the day. The kitchen is spread across three floors and spans three quarters the area of an American football field. Inside, 70 staff members break into small units, working in unison to prep, cook, and package all of these meals in just under four hours. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
たちの誇りに可能性があるかということで、確認をするために、あの2週間程度、保存をしています。そのための温度とあの匂いだったり、物が混入しているかなどは確認をしています。Besides safety, the kitchen prioritizes using fresh, organic, and local ingredients. やはりですね、食育という観点でしっかりはしっかりあの日本の食文化を伝えていくという観点で和食混雑を出しています。国内産を中心にですね、有機ジャスや特別栽培を優先して使っています。将来子どもたちが食卓を担うようになった際にですね。えー、身近にある日常的な食材を使ってしっかりと献立が立てられるようにそういった見本になるようなことを考えて献立を立てています私どもの献立ではですね、まあ、あの基本は週に3日はお米ご飯ですそれで1日はパン残り1日は麺類が、えー、基本となっておりますが To make the rice, the kitchen uses six giant pots 今は43キロ、43キロです。かき混ぜるの大変そうですね。それだけあると。はい。結構タイヤ使います。In total, 250 kilograms of rice will be made in a very short period of time using a special process. 一度に大量のお米を炊くためには、湯炊きという炊飯方法になります。この湯炊きというのは。炊飯で一番大事なお米を入れてから沸騰するまでの時間を短くするために一度お湯を沸かした中にお米を投入して攪拌をするという、まあ、大量調理の特殊な方法になります。And finally, this is the main cooking area where the cabbage and mustard saute is made. 140 kg of the washed cabbage is boiled before getting sauteed with komatsuna leaf and carrots. Once all of the food is cooked, meals are portioned into thermal containers and loaded into five delivery trucks. えー、桜包み調理場では、えー、一律の中学校6校と小学校2校合わせて8校に対して、えー、合計3000食の給食を提供しています子どもの好きなものを足したいという気持ちはありますけれどもやはりあの食育の観点と、まあ、栄養バランスのこともありますので、まあ、子どもの好きなものばかり出すわけではありませんあの味覚のです、ね、発達を促すためにも、えー、いろいろな食材ですとか料理を食べてもらいたいと考えています、えー、伝統的な食文化とですね、えー、食材の生産と、えー、消費についての理解を深めてもらって、えー、食についての、まあ、正しい理解を深めることでですね子どもたちが、まあ、将来大人になった時に、えー、正しい、まあ、食生活、えー、食習慣を身につけるというようなことを目的としています。All of the ingredients used are funded by the students' families who pay school lunch fees. Each meal costs about 340 yen, or roughly $2.50, for middle school students, and about 240 to 280 yen for elementary students. でまあ給食を通じてですね、えー、食への関心を高めてもらって正しい食習慣を身につけることを目的としています自慢できるところは、えー、最新の設備と、えー、地域人材の活用だと思っています、えー、最新の学校給食衛生管理基準に対応したですね、えー、衛生的な設備とあとまあ、えー空調の設備と、まあ、職員が働きやすい環境であります。まあ、皆さん、えー、児童生徒のために、まあ、一生懸命働いていただいておりまして、えー、そうですね。こちらの施設の原動力の一つとなっています。
This dag or cauldron located at the Ashmer Sharif Darga in Rajasthan, India is one of the largest in the world. Donated by Mughal Emperor Akbar in 1567, the dag measures 37 feet wide and was made in such a way that the rim never gets hot, even while the fire is ignited and the food is being cooked. Here, volunteers are making 4,800 kilograms of a sweet rice dish called zarda to feed the 20 to 25,000 devotees who visit the shrine each day. Keeping a watchful eye over the cooking process is Syed Mujahid Hamer Chisti, who is also in charge of tending to the devotees. Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Isai, Parsi, Brahman, we visited the shrine to see how they make the sweet prasad in such big batches. Before any food is made, volunteers must empty the cauldron of donations left by pilgrims, which could include money, rice, lentils or other groceries that the temple can use to make the prasad. Then it's time to start cooking. Making this dish is time intensive and begins by lighting a wood fire underneath the deg. There are four openings around the deg and 50 kilograms of wood is kept at each one to keep the fire going strong. The devotees who have sponsored that day's meal then gather around the cauldron to help with the dish's preparation. First, they fill the cauldron with 4,000 liters of water. They also add jugs of saffron water and rose water, which help add a depth of flavor to the finished dish. उसके बाद उसके अंदर में हल्दी डाली जाती है, आटा डाला जाता है, उसके बाद मैदा डाला जाता है। मैदा और आटे का ये है कि उसका कोई परत नहीं है। once the mixture starts to boil, volunteers carry bags of sugar up to the cauldron platform and pour them inside. Then it's time to stir the mixture, which is easier said than done. Since the deck measures 37 feet wide and 15 feet deep, it takes at least four volunteers to maneuver a large wooden oar. Two people push and pull on the wooden handle, while across the cauldron, two people use ropes that are attached to the bottom. They move in tandem with each other to establish a rhythm. Volunteers then add in over 1,100 kilograms of rice and multiple cans of ghee. They continue to stir the mixture until it thickens and reaches a smooth consistency. Dry fruits and nuts like cashews, almonds and pistachios are added as a final touch before the dish is ready to be served. And when it comes to the end, it is added to the seed of the seed. That volunteer will wear special shoe covers that are cleaned before each meal. They scoop the rice with buckets and pass them along a line to fill large steel barrels.
Once these are full, volunteers scoop the sweet prasad into small bowls and hand them out to hungry pilgrims. It was a little sweet, a little sweet, a little sweet, a little sweet. It was very good. It was very tasty. It was very tasty. It was very tasty. The Deg and the Tomb both have an incredible history. Baba Ke Darbar is 900 years old. In Baba Ke Darbar, this Deg was given to Baba Ke Darbar, which is made from 500 years old. This is made from 500 years old. It is made from today. But the cauldron is only filled to capacity on special occasions or when the number of devotees at the Dargah is very high. On most days, the temple uses a second, smaller cauldron known as the Choti Deg, which was donated by Akbar son Jehangir in 1613. Yet, regardless of which cauldron is used, thousands of pilgrims visit the sacred site every day to eat the prasad and seek the blessings of the saint. This dish is a special thing that the person who eats the food, the person who eats the food, is full of the food. This is very soft, it's tasty, it's a good taste, and it's very good. Today, it's very famous for the food. यहाँ सब की ख्वाहिश होती है कि यहाँ पे एक बार ज़्यादा ज़रूर करें और मेरी दिली तमन्ना है कि जो ख्वाहिश में लेके आया हूँ यहाँ पे इंशाल्लाह वो पूरी हो जाए। 500 साल से ये मीठा प्रसाद बनता है। ये बड़ी देख की खास बात ये है कि इसके अंदर में ये भाईचारा का एक प्रतीक है हिंदू मुसलमान सिख � मैं तो खाता ही रहता हूँ इसी पे पल रहा हूँ मैं क्योंकि मैं शुरू से ही बचपन से ये चीजें खाता आया हूँ और लोगों को बहुत ही दहेज लगता है जो एक दफे खाता है दोबारा मांगता है During the month of Ramadan, this kitchen runs 24 hours a day, mashing goat, chilies spices and ghee into a thick and creamy stew known as halim. For 25 years, Mohammed Abdul Majid and his sons have been running Pista House, a popular chain known for making this dish on massive scales. Today, the halim is being made, so its target is that we will eat at least 60 to 70,000 people. Halim is popularly consumed by Muslims in Hyderabad during Ramadan, who often break their daily fast with this high-protein and calorically rich dish. But that doesn't mean it's exclusive. And this dish is not dish that is only Muslim dish or only Muslim dish. It's our India dish. We visited Pista House's central kitchen to see how it makes Halim in such big batches. The day begins with unloading and weighing all of the vegetables. The time to make the halim, if you have seen it, it takes totally 24 hours. Mountains of onions, green chilies and garlic are peeled by hand. The onions are then grated through machines while the garlic is mashed into a paste. On the other side of the kitchen, hundreds of goats are wheeled into a large room and chopped into smaller pieces. The biggest challenge in making halim is the meat selection. And we use goat meat. In the goat meat, it's good to be good. It should be good to be good. It should be good to be good. It should be good to be good. It should be good to be good. Every pot is filled with 100 liters of water, followed by 100 kilograms of goat, and 9.5 kilograms of green chilies. Once filled, the pots are covered and left to boil for 5 to 6 hours. Then the lids are removed and a mixture of cilantro, basmati rice and the ginger garlic paste that was prepared earlier is poured inside. 
Once that has cooked through, a huge pot of soaked wheat flour is added. So 60% sherbati is 40% Keeping a consistent temperature and constantly stirring the mixture are two of the biggest challenges when making halim. Rave ko garam pani ko aur niche jo aag jalte rehti hai kyunki raat thoda bhi agar uske andar rahega to jo hai uske andar usko daag jo bolte hain jo chipak jata hai to usme bo bo aati hai uske andar. Once the flour is mixed it's time for the spices. जो जो हमारे स्पाइसेस हैं स्पाइसेस में इलायची दालचीनी कबाब चीनी लौंग शहद जीरा और जीरा रोज पेटल्स काली मिर्ची और कबाब चीनी ये धनिया पाउडर ये सब इसमें हर हिसाब से 100 केजी के हिसाब से मिक्स करते हैं इसको ये पूरे ऐसे मसाले लगते हैं इसके अलावा भी जो है हमारा एक सीक्रेट जो फार्मूला है वो भी लगता है वो सीक्रेट है वो तो उसके अंदर जो है वो भी लगता है after the masala is added, they seal the pots for steaming, which allows the flavors to be completely absorbed. So, the steam is done steam, it's done in two hours. Next is the most physically demanding part of the cooking process, smashing the halim. Workers pour large bags of ghee into the pots and use wooden sledgehammers to smash the halim for 30 minutes in a process called hotel. Each of these hammers weighs 17 pounds, making this strenuous work. The most challenge and difficulty in this is that it is totally manual. So, it is necessary to do the whole work in और मैनुअल हम रखना ही चाह रहे हैं मैनुअल का क्योंकि इससे जो है लोगों को जॉब्स मिलते हैं अगर हम जो है एटो एटोमेशन में गए तो जॉब्स कम हो जाते हैं When the mixture reaches a smoother consistency they add lentil paste and continue mashing for another 15 to 20 minutes Finally, it's topped with boiled ghee, then scooped into thermal containers and wheeled to another room where it's weighed and loaded onto delivery trucks. At every Pista House location, Halim is served in to-go containers and always with toppings. Final, we have a topping of Halim. Brown onion, dhania powder, kothmir, pure ghee, lemon, tira, vanta. Arab merchants are believed to have introduced Halim to India under the name Haris sometime during the 17th century. The Halim came to India वो निजाम की पीरियड में आई थी। जब यहाँ के रोलर जो निजाम थे, उनके पीरियड में हाली में हाली में आई थी, जैसे गल्फ कंट्री से आई थी और ईरान से आई थी। हैदराबाद आने के बाद, वहाँ पर जो है स्पाइसेस नहीं हैं, जैसे सऊदी अरेबिया में या जो भी गल्फ कंट्रीज में स्पाइसेस नहीं हैं। तो बहुत ही फीकी हाली कि हम वहाँ से जो हरी मैं थी, यहाँ से बना के फिर वापस हम वहाँ पर भेज रहे हैं लोग। पिस्ता उसका ये बड़ा कारनामा है कि यहाँ से बना के वहाँ भेज रहे हैं। While Halim is exclusively cooked during Ramadan, many locals who are not Muslim enjoy it just as much, and many of the people who buy this Halim 
have been doing so for years. I'm eating Pista House for 24 years. It's very beautiful to make this Halim Pista House. It's not possible to say it in the language. What is it? It's a strange thing. It's only to feel it. It's not possible to tell it in the language. ये इसमें जो काम है ये दिनों का ना महीनों का काम है और मैं तो ये बोलता हूँ कि जैसा रमजान रमजान खत्म हो गया एक महीने के बाद तैयारी शुरू करेंगे हम लोग This team of bakers makes around 1,200 trays of baklava every week. And Master Chef Mehmed Akinjorlu has to pay careful attention to every step of the process. Ufak bir şeyden baklava şey olur mu heder olur oluyor ya olur ya. Usta bir baklavacı olmak beş ile on yıl arası değişir. We visited Akinjorlu baklava to see how it makes its baklava in such big batches. The day begins at 5 a.m., making the daily dough. Hard wheat flour, water, eggs and salt are added into a mechanical mixer and combined for 20 to 25 minutes. Once soft, the dough is taken out, cut, weighed and kneaded into small disks that are left to rest for another 20 to 25 minutes. Beklemekten sonra da hamurun kelbelli kıvamı, o beklediği kıvamı bulduktan sonra da makine bölümüne geçiyoruz. The discs are loaded into the dough sheeter and run back and forth to flatten and elongate them. Tabi bu makineyi kullanmak da ayrı bir şey. Sağ ve sol şeylerini yaparaktan sağa sola gitmesini şey yapıyoruz. Aynı şekilde burada derecesini şey yaparaktan da incelmesini sağlıyoruz hamurumuzun. Hamurumuzu belli dediğimiz derece inceliğe geldikten sonra da elle alıp havaya sarıp döşeme bölümünü alacağız. Here, chefs roll 10 to 15 sheets of dough at a time and generously coat them in starch so they don't stick together. Burada açılan oklava da çok önemli. Şöyle söyleyeyim, bu oklava alet malzemesi çok en şeydir. Meşe veya dut odunundan olması gerekir. Sertliğini eğilmemesi, düzgünlüğünü muhafaza etmesi için çok önemli bir açım aletidir burada yani. Every sheet of dough is rolled until it's paper thin. Hamur ne kadar ince olmalı? Hamur ne kadar ince olursa o kadar baklavadaki kışırlığı ve lezzeti, o görüntüyü, parlaklığı daha iyi alırsınız. Onun için zar gibi dediğimiz tabir ettiğimiz veya kağıt gibi dediğimiz tabir olması gerekiyor. O şeyi yakaladığımız zaman tamam diyoruz ya. The thinly rolled dough is then brought to a table to fill each pan. İçeride çekmiş olduğumuz hamurlar açıldıktan sonra işte buraya bu bölüme gelerekten bu şekilde gelen hamurlarımızı taban bölümünü bu şekilde döşüyoruz, döşe döşeme yapıyoruz. Bu hamurun ölçütü yok. Ne kadar inceltilebilirse incelmesinde fayda var. Tabi bundan sonra gördüğünüz gibi elimiz dahi gözükecek derecede incelmiş durumda. Bu tabunu incelmek de ustaların marifetini. Gösteriyor, gerek, gerektiriyor. Ee, ne kadar da incelirse, incelirse o kadar hamurun baklavamız kışır ve güzel olur. Peki, e, 15-16-17 kat kadar hamur döşüyoruz. Tepsi nebatlarına göre değişiyor bu tabi. Daha sonra süt kaymağı dediğimiz, imritle yapmış olduğumuz kaymağı bir kat tabanla yatırıyoruz. Daha sonra ise... Next, a mountain of special buds pistachios is added into the tray. Bu fıstığın özelliği ağaçta daha tam olmadan, yani ağaçta fıstıktan dolgunlaşmadan e, toplanmış olmasıdır. Toplandan dolayı bu ağaçta ta, fıstık taze ve daha genç bir şekilde elde ediliyor. Ve dolayısıyla çekildiği zaman bu fıstık müthiş bir reha, müthiş bir koku elde ediyorsun fıstıkla. All of the pistachios Mehmet uses are harvested locally and picked within 10 to 15 days of sprouting. Daha sonra olursa fıstık dolgunlaşıyor. Dolgunlaşırsa o içerisindeki e, dediğimiz o rehayı, o şeyi, o yeşilliği, o rengi alamıyoruz fıstıktan. 
The pistachios are topped with another 15 to 20 layers of dough before they are taken to the slicing section. Here Mehmet and his team add the final layers of dough to the top of the baklava and laminate each layer with melted butter. As with the pistachios, Mehmet carefully selects his butter from sheep that have been grazing on mountain plants. To retain its flavor, the butter is melted with steam. Belli ısı ya geliyor. Isı ne fazla olacak, ne az olacak. Eğer fazla olursa baklavamızın yüzü çökük olur. Az olursa da yine baklavamız kabarmaz. Yani kabarmadığımız kabarlıkla elde etti demeyiz. Ve şu an tekrar bir dilim işlemlerine başlayalım. Ver Abdullah. Bunu da tekrar yüzdüğünü çekerken süpürgenin ucunu batırıyoruz. Çekiyoruz. Bunları da böyle... Bu hamurumuzun e, açılan en ortak kısmı, e, ince kısmı, en kıymetli yeri. Onun için bunu da en üstüne atıyoruz. Once the last layer of dough is applied, bakers cut the excess and slice strips across the tray. Then they coat the tray in another layer of butter and cut it again into its famous diamond shape. The baklava is now ready to bake. Mehmet uses a traditional stone oven fueled with oak wood to cook the baklava. Derecesi de yine modern dereceler var ama biz yine eski usul ustalarımızdan gördüğümüz elimizi içimize sokaraktan, bakaraktan, sayaraktan şey yapabiliyoruz. Yoksa da normal eski usul de var, yeni derece de var. Yeni derecede ile söyleyecek olursak da bu 270-280 derecelerde patlamamız bir şey yok. Each tray bakes for 25 to 35 minutes depending on the style of the baklava and how thick it is. Once cooked, the baklava rests for up to 40 minutes. The baked baklava is placed on a burner to get the bottom crispy. When it achieves the right color and consistency, it's time to sweeten the dish. But if there's not enough sugar, the baklava will be too soft and dry. And if there is too much, it will lack the right crispness and flavor. Son aşamada şekeri gevşek verdiğiniz zaman baklava hamurla hamursu oluyor. Sert verdiğiniz zaman sert bir lezzeti, istediğiniz lezzeti alamıyorsunuz. Bu şekerin tam olup olmadığını buradan bakaraktan anlıyoruz. Eğer iyi ise tamam, değilse de tekrar biraz su ilave ederekten şey yapıyoruz. Devam ediyoruz. Baklava lezzettir, baklava açtır, baklava göz nurudur, emektir, ee, dünyanın en lezzetli tatlısıdır. After three hours of prep and cooking, the baklava is ready to eat. Her tepsiden, e, yani normal bir 3 kilo tepsiden bahsedecek olursak, yani 25-30 porsiyon gibi çıkar yani. It's believed that baklava was adapted from a savory layered pastry known as börek, which was popular across Central Asia in the 11th century. Over time, it's believed that it was combined with the Arab practice of soaking pastries and donuts in honey or sugar syrup. Some of the earliest mentions of baklava in Turkey come from the 1400s. It was enjoyed by sultans during the Ottoman Empire and remains a popular dish among locals today. E, hamurunun doğallığı, orijinal fısık kullanmaları ve yağının çok kaliteli olmasından dolayı buraya baklava yemeye geliyorum. Tatlı hayatımda önemli bir yere sahip, çok severim. Buran bölge, Buran bölgesinden olduğu için hamur olsun, çiğ olsun, fıstık olsun lezzeti başka şehirde bulamazsın buradaki lezzeti. 
değişik şeylere git, bu lezzeti buradaki lezzeti orada bulamazsın. Antep baklavasının özelliği çıtır, çıtır diye ses gelir. Ve ağzında dağılır. Hoş bir tat bırakır. Onun için bizim işimiz, bizim mesleğimiz, bizim sanatkar, sanatımız çok hassas, çok ince bir özveri gerektiriyor, çok dikkat gerektiriyor. Tabii ki ekip olması gerekiyor. Her alanda çalışan arkadaşların bu özveriyi, bu, bu iş, işten gelme duygusunu yapması gerekiyor. Yoksa bu istenilen lezzeti, istenilen tadı yakalayamıyoruz yani. Bak, o yaparken en önemli öğrendiğim ders işi, işini severek yapmak. Prepared in the neighborhood of El Mataria in Cairo, this is one of the largest iftar meals in Egypt. On the 15th of Ramadan, the evening meal for breaking the day's fast is cooked entirely by volunteers. But there is no way all this food can only be cooked on the streets. We'll be visiting chefs Hamed Akram and Mohamed Ibrahim and the women preparing traditional homemade dishes to see how they prepare this iftar in such big batches. In the streets, Chef Mohamed is grilling 500 kilograms of shish tarouk, a type of grilled chicken which will be part of the main course. In the morning, the chicken is brought to the cooking area after marinating overnight in onions, yogurt, mustard and spices. The chefs then load them into grill baskets before cooking them over coals. احنا عندنا خمس شوايات كل شوايه واقف عليها شيف ده محرك شايف كده اهوت دوت شيش على الفحم ودوت بانيه مشوي على الفحم والله بنحتاج ممكن مثلا من خمس ساعات كده عشان خاطر يكون الاكل مثلا جاهز ويجي The grilled chicken is then cut in half and put on a metal platter for packaging In another area of the street kitchen, Chef Hamed is making 170 kilograms of rice, which is easier said than done. أصعب حاجة بالنسبة لنا إن أنت تبي شغالة وبتجهز وبتعملي أكل وأنت صايمة يعني الموضوع صعب صعب فعلا صعب إن إحنا مش فطرين وبنحاول إن إحنا عايزين نطلع الحاجة كويسة بتسي كويس. While he's unable to taste the food, Hamed makes several pots of rice with garlic. Onions, ginger, peppers, saffron, cardamom, cloves, cinnamon, and bay leaves. يعني إن الحلة إحنا جايبين حلة الكبيرة أنا جايب حلة الكبيرة الحلة بشيل خمسة عشر كيلو إحنا عاملين نار ضلا ملك الحمد داخلين في الحداش أزان ما فعش إن إحنا نعطى ما فعش إن أنا دلوقتي أسوي رز واستنى الحلة لما تخلص عشان خاطر أغسلها وأسوي فيها تاني. While the main dishes are cooked in the street. Other items like mashi and kebab hala are cooked in 30 different homes by volunteers who have experience making them. They receive their supplies a few days before the event from organizers like Ali Amin. We are going to get them the clothes and all the clothes that they need to get them in a few days. And they start to get them the clothes in a few days in a few days so that on the day of 15 Ramadan, the time of 2 o'clock, they get all the clothes in a few days. In her house, Um Mustafa is making mashi, or vegetables stuffed with rice. Fitar al Matariya, aslan, يعني أنا بقالي معهم خمس سنين أو ست سنين على طول كل سنة في الفطار بعمل محش. أنا بالنسبة لي أكليني كل يوم محش أقول لك إيش لا أبدا. The first step of making mashi is making a tomato sauce. وبنعمل لها إن نقلي البصلة وبعدين نحط عليها القطة وبعدين نسبها تتسبك. وتتقل خالص بعد كده بقى نحط لها التوابل بتاعتها وبعد ما بنحضر خلطة التوابل بنحط فوق منها الرز After mixing it all together they finish it off with cilantro While Um is doing this across the street Huda San is busy preparing four pots of her kebab hala a type of onion beef braised too. ليش أنا عشان نعمل الكباب الحلة ده 
بستخدم بصل توابل ملح وفلفل وحبهان وورق لورا وقرفة واللحمة طبعا بتبقى متقطعة وبس وبنبتدي بقى ان هو اصلا يعني اكتر حاجه فيه التقليب يعني بنفضل طول الوقت نقلب فيه لغايه ما يبقى يدي اللون ده يعني لان ده اساسي فيه Back at Oom's house she is hollowing out the vegetables so they can be stuffed with the rice mixture احنا بنحشي الكوسه وفلفل والبتنجان بالبرز الخلطه والخلطه دي بسم الله ما شاء الله عليها هي بقى اللي ايه اللي اللي احنا عاملينها بالبصل والقوطه والتوابل والخضره انا بحب احط على المحشي بهارات وحبهان مطحون وفلفل اسمر وكمون وشويه شطه بس انا ما حطيتش شطه كتير المره دي عشان يعني في حد ما مش بيحب الشط فحرام اذيه Once the vegetables are stuffed she covers them with stock and boils them until they're cooked through تقريبا بعمل في حدود 5 كيلو محشي. But to make enough mashi and kebab hala to feed an entire neighborhood, both of these women have help. كل سنة كعيلة يعني بنبقى مسؤولين عن الأكلة دي يعني، بس في ناس طبعا كتير بتعمل حاجات تانية يعني. أو في طبعا أنا فوق طبعا بنت خالي برضه بتعمل كباب حلة هناك عند بيت جدي برضه مرات خالي ومرات خالي التانية و... هي والدتي أصلا يعني أنا والدتي أصلا هي اللي كانت بتعمل كباب الحلة. فتحس ان يتورثوا الأجل... الاجيال in the early afternoon volunteers pick up the mashi and kebab hala and bring them to the center kitchen for packaging كل بيت بنبقى كاتبين على الحله اسم اسم البيت ده عشان نعرف هنرجعها تاني ازاي volunteers form an assembly line and pack every meal by hand بنبتدي ان احنا نغرف من ثلاثة لحد مثلا خمسة خمسة ونص بنقعد ساعتين ونص في فريق كامل واقف في المطبخ ما بيعملش حاجة الا هو بيغرف. All of the food is carried through the crowd and placed on 500 tables stretching a kilometer down the street. احنا كنا عاملينها في أربع شوارع الأربع شوارع كان فيهم ثلاث شوارع كانت المعمولة المائدة صفين يعني مش صف واحد بس لا يعني كانت طول الشارع على مرتين. طيب هو الاكل ده كله احنا بنقدمه للناس بشكل مجاني اكيد مش هناخد من ضيوفنا فلوس and when the sun finally sets the community can enjoy their feast طبعا هو اليوم مش مقتصر على اهالي المنطقه بس او اهالي المطريه بس لا بالعكس اليوم احنا فاتحينه لكل الناس والله هنا كلهم متفقين مع بعض وكلنا اهل وكلنا اسره وكلنا يعني رمضان كريم يعني الحمد لله عجبتني في الاكل الطاجن باللحمه البصل وعجبني المحشي وعجبني كل الاكل اللي كان كويس بس. واحنا مش عاملينها عشان اكل احنا عاملينها عشان تجمع ان احنا نبقى كلنا مسلمين مسيحيين كلنا مع بعضينا وعاملين ان شاء الله وكان يوم كويس ويوم حلو وان شاء الله عودا السنه الجايه ان شاء الله يبقى احسن واحسن ان شاء الله احنا ما ابتدينا ابتدينا في 2013 اخواتنا قرروا ان هم يفطروا مع بعض يوم المجموعه كلها على بعضها ما كملتش مثلا 10 تنفار ترابيزتين احنا السنه دي بنتكلم في 3000 فرد ومعدين ال 3000 فرد الموضوع كل مدى اصعب وضغط كل الكلام دوت بسبب الروح اللي حوالينا وزمايلنا ومساعده اخواتنا وامهاتنا في البيت واخواتنا الصغيرين واولادنا الحمد لله بفضل الله بيطلع احسن يوم الحمد لله رب العالمين يمكن يكون يوم بنستناه من السنه للسنه Every year, communities across Milpa Alta, Mexico, come together to cook a massive feast called the Junta. For 48 hours, 500 volunteers work around the clock, often without sleep, to prepare over 3,000 kilograms of tamales, mole, and rice. And there is a lot riding on this feast. If all goes well, the community will raise enough money to support an important religious pilgrimage to Chalma. We visited Milpa Alta to see how these volunteers make food for the junta in such big batches. The first day of cooking begins with washing and shucking 300 bunches of dried corn husks so they can be used to wrap tamales the next day. 
Yesenia González Lemus is one of the dedicated volunteers with many years of experience making tamales for the Junta. Pues todo es muy bonito, desde hacer este el lavado de hojas. Aquí la verdad a veces nos encontramos con las señoras que a veces tienen mucho tiempo que no nos hemos visto. Eh, todo viene con gusto. While some groups wash the leaves, others strain black beans that have been soaking overnight and transfer them into buckets. These buckets are then poured into two giant pots, where the beans are boiled in water with onions, garlic and lard. The cooked beans are then sent to a mill to be ground into a paste. Across the kitchen, butchers are busy cutting and cleaning 1,200 kilograms of pork and beef. On the second day, large bags of ground beans and masa and nixtamalized corn mix arrive from the mill. The masa and black beans are poured onto large tables where they're mixed with water, lard, salt and tequesquite a mineral salt that has been used in Mexico since pre-Columbian times. Once mixed, the masa is taken to another table where it's spread into a flat layer, then topped with black beans. Then workers cut the mix into squares with their fingers and roll them up. These rolls are then passed to another table where they're stuffed inside of the corn husks to become tamales. Pues nosotros nada más, este, no hay un cálculo exacto en piezas de tamal. Lo que sí tenemos el cálculo que se hace una tonelada de masa con una tonelada de maíz. O sea, son mil kilos de masa y mil kilos de frijol. Volunteers pile the rolled tamales into crates and carry them to the cooking area. Here, they pour the tamales into 68 oil drums that are lined with paper bags. They fill every drum to the top before wrapping it in a plastic bag, which helps steam the tamales. After they tie the bags, they light wood fires under each drum. The tamales start cooking in the early afternoon and are left until early morning. The next order of business is making mole, a thick, rich sauce made with a blend of ground chilies, spices and chocolate. The ground mole arrives in 50 kg bags, which need to be sifted to remove clumps before cooking. Then the mole is added into giant pots of boiling water, where it's left with expert mole cookers known as moleros. Gustavo Álvarez Jurado, who is the head molero, has been helping make this dish for over 26 years. Nuestra labor en realidad como moleros es venir y sazonar ese mole que ya está elaborado. Y además nos corresponde sazonarlo, cocerlo, guisarlo y repartirlo a la gente que viene a traerlo. Ya depende de mañana domingo cómo vaya fluyendo la gente, cómo vaya viniendo a traer su molito, es como se va Hacer un poquito más de mole, se sazona un poquito más para el día lunes. Mole flavor varies across Mexico. In Milpa Alta, a sweeter taste is preferred, so sugar is added to the mixture. Making this mole requires constant attention and stirring, so it doesn't burn or stick to the pot. Hector Quintín Mesa is one of Milpa Alta's most experienced moleros. Es el... es un... Un mole tradicional, pero es que es tradicional de, de, de, la, de las señoras que, que dejaron este, pues la receta. ¿Esta viene de generaciones? De generaciones anteriores. While the mole cooks, another massive pot is filled with water and brought to a boil. This pot is what's used to boil all of the meat that was cut the day before. At 2 a.m., the rice is ready to be made. White rice, carrots, crushed tomatoes, parsley and spices are all mixed together and boiled. This year, the kitchen is using 25 pots that can cook 200 kilograms of rice in 30 minutes. And by the end of the night, they'll cook 800 kilograms. Central to these processes is the mayordomo, 
a role that is responsible for securing all of the ingredients and utensils needed to make the feast possible. This year, the responsibility is being shared by Paulina Hardines and her brother Isaac. <laughs> no, de hecho no nos alcanza este. ¿Por qué? Porque pues está viniendo la gente, están con diferentes actividades y pues no los podemos dejar solos. Se puede decir que son como dos noches que no se duerme. Like mayordomos before, Pauline and her brother have been waiting over 20 years to receive this position and following the footsteps of their mother, Alejandra, who served as a mayordomo in 2001. Híjole, ser mayordomo es una experiencia inolvidable y además una responsabilidad, ya que, pues sí, conlleva estar, este, pues, tratando con mucha gente diferente y este pues tratar de nosotros ser lo más amables posibles ya que ellos vienen a apoyarnos con sus manitas que es lo más importante ofrecen su tiempo y pues su, así su dedicación para prepararlo y que salga lo mejor posible ya son personas que pues sí se dedican a estar ahí entonces ellos ya saben qué medida qué tanto se pone de cada ingrediente pues Creo que es importante que esta tradición siga al igual que otras, porque pues a mi parecer sin las tradiciones pues no no sé qué se dan en estos pueblos. ¿no? At 6 a.m. everyone takes a short break to attend the mass. After the mass, the priest goes around the kitchen and blesses all of the food. In a tent, guests check in and write their names on cards to indicate how much money they're going to donate to the mayordomo for the pilgrimage to Chalma. Everyone who pledges money receives a corresponding amount of food, which is indicated on their card. But really, the meal is for anyone and everyone who donates their time, money or goods for the event. Instead of eating in the kitchen, many people bring their own containers from home and take the food away. Gracias a Dios y afortunadamente ahorita nosotros todo salió bien. No hubo ninguna caceruela de Dios que se echara a perder o que tirara. Entonces yo creo que es tanto el amor y aunque uno esté cansado no lo demuestra uno porque lo que queremos es seguir, seguir, no hasta terminar y que terminemos todo bien. Uh -huh. Todo este dinero recaudado sirve para que estemos allá en los ocho días que, que se celebra el Señor y la coronación de los nuevos integrantes para la generación siguiente. Chalma is a major pilgrimage site for Catholics in Mexico, who make the pilgrimage on foot from various parts of the country. The site is also known for miraculous healing powers, and people from all over come to seek blessings and miracles. Y este, y yo creo que es un compromiso no solo lo adquiere el mayordomo, sino lo adquiere toda la familia, a, familia, amigos, compadres, este, y toda la gente que, pues, cada año está aquí con la mayordomía. Ahorita están conmigo, el otro año, pues, estarán con el compañero que va recibiendo. Pues hoy es una de las tradiciones más importantes de Milpalta porque se reúne, pues, toda la comunidad en torno a la fe que tenemos al señor de Chalma. Para nosotros el señor de Chalma es este, nuestro patrón, nuestro señor, nuestro padre, como quieran decirle. Before the Spanish conquest, indigenous deities with magical powers were worshipped here. When the missionaries arrived, they brought their faith and proclaimed a miracle had taken place in Chalma, cementing it as a religious site for Roman Catholics all over Mexico. Porque, pues... Todos los que nacemos aquí crecemos bajo esas tradiciones y costumbres y sobre todo porque fortalece nuestra fe como comunidad. Las visitas al santuario de Chalma son la verdad muy bonitas y pues yo creo que todo eso, lo que se vivió fue lo que, y el amor al Señor, que pues para mí fue un legado que mi papá nos dejó. Siento que pues todo eso nos motivó a querer estar aquí donde estamos ahorita. These cooks make up to 13,200 meals a day for the 4,400 cadets here at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. Today, the team is making over 22,000 meatballs, 
combined with 4,000 pounds of noodles and 150 gallons of tomato sauce. And that's just for one of the dishes on the lunch menu. I would say in comparison to, to a standard college, we do things a little differently, I think, than, than most colleges do. Attention all cadets. For lunch, we are having chicken. There are lunchtime rituals, and each meal is balanced specifically for these future military leaders' rigorous workload. On a normal day, we're probably providing between 12 and 1,500 calories for these individuals. Now, whether they eat all of that, right, is up to them and what they're choosing for that day. The cadets' nutritional requirements are elevated because they are engaging in academic work, in military training, as well as their physical exercise that they're completing here day to day. Every meal is earned, not given. So the fact that we are able to march in step, keep our military bearing, shows after a long day or long morning of classes, we've earned this meal. Meals at West Point are served here at Washington Hall, the historic mess hall where Army cooks have been feeding West Point cadets for nearly 100 years. At meal times, the destination is Washington Hall, where the cadet gains back the pounds he lost during last summer's hike. And the food is tops in wholesomeness. Probably our most difficult meal to support here is our lunch meals, where, where the cadets have about 25 minutes to, to get into the building, sit down, eat, and get out. I think the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is how fast it all goes. So it starts at noon at formation. We all get in there by 1210. And then after that, the food is served to 4,000 people and eaten all within 15 minutes. But it's not just the cadets who have to move fast. A lot of the, the cook staff who have been in those military environments and who have understood what that means to serve and, and what that looks like. So I think they try to structure the menu so that they may see similar things when they're out and you know, not at West Point. But how does the staff at West Point prepare over 4,000 nutritious meals that can be served and eaten in under 25 minutes? Insider was granted rare access to the mess hall to see how they pull it off. The food is prepared underneath the mess hall, in the labyrinth of hallways, kitchens, and freezers. So feeding 4,000 cadets is certainly a challenge. It is also a, a very well-oiled machine. You've got multiple uh, refrigerators and freezers here. My whole background in the Army has been in food service the entire 20 years that I've been in the Army. In the cadet mess, I have approximately 90 Department of the Army civilian employees that are our cooks. They're the ones that cook all the food. But we also have another approximately 130 or so contractors that work in, in the mess here, and their job is to actually serve the food to the cadets. The, the challenges to preparing 4,000 meals three times a day are substantial. Our staff is arriving at, at 3.30 in the morning, and we're not opening for breakfast for another three hours, but the reason is because it takes that three hours to, to prepare food for 4,500 cadets. On the menu for today's lunch, spaghetti with meatballs, breadsticks, fruit salad, broccoli, and iced cake. Prepping enough spaghetti for over 4,000 students starts nearly two hours before lunchtime. In the large kitchen, cooks start the spaghetti by boiling 400 pounds of pasta in these giant vats. Then, they add 22,500 meatballs, which they prepared early this morning, enough for each cadet to have five. With the spaghetti underway, cooks begin steaming 720 pounds of broccoli. Meanwhile, in the bakery, 400 cakes are being iced and placed on carts. Back in the main kitchen, cooks drain the water from the vats and add 150 gallons of tomato sauce. While the spaghetti is simmering, cooks in a temperature-controlled cold kitchen are preparing for a lunch that won't be served for another two days. These cooks are opening two pallets of frozen ribs weighing 3,600 pounds 
and breaking them into pieces. Prepping meals days in advance is one of the methods the mess hall staff uses to serve so many cadets so quickly. For menu development, I work with a dietitian that works for the United States Corps of Cadets, which is upstairs from the cadet mess here. We come up with options that using Army recipes that are that are in the Army system, as well as other recipes that you know are available online, and we review those recipes, make sure that they meet the dietary guidelines that they need to meet for uh, West Point's standards, and then we try them out. I am a registered dietitian and a certified specialist in sports dietetics for the Corps of Cadets at West Point. So the menus are structured in a certain way to make sure that they are meeting all of their calorie requirements. So on the menus, there's usually carbohydrate-based foods, which are going to fuel their brain health and support their academic performance as well as prime their muscles for some of that moderate to high intensity exercise that they're going to engage in. Um, and then we usually have plant and animal based protein sources in order to support their tissue and muscle recovery. And then we have a lot of different fruit and vegetable options, so fresh fruit. Um, we have uh, cooked vegetables at the table as well as a pretty robust salad bar that provides lots of antioxidants to make sure that they get that color in, it supports their immune system, and make sure that they combat some of that inflammation that's incurring from that intense exercise. Once all the dishes are finished, they are served into portioned containers and loaded into heated carts. We have around 50 to 75 of the hot carts uh, going, so generally speaking, each, each hot cart will hold food for about 10 tables. 10 minutes until assembly for lunch formation. Before lunch formation and before morning formation, the plebes call minutes and they say the meal for that day. For lunch, we are having chicken, rice, and vegetables. After receiving the minutes read aloud by freshmen known as plebes, Five minutes remaining. Cadets get into company formation in front of Washington Hall in an area called the apron. All right, right. While the students gather, members of the West Point band play them into formation. <laughs> Meanwhile, Inside the mess hall, the wait staff is setting out the water and bread for the 25-minute meal. Oh, it's like everything you've seen in the movies. Before formation, we hear the band start kicking off, really telling us to fall in the companies. Four count four. Once the accountability is taken of the company, then the battalion, and the regiment, we all start marching to the beat of the drum to the mess hall. And really, the drums help us stay in step, keep the cadence, and keeping our military bearing. As cadets file in, the wait staff has only six minutes to get the food from the hot carts onto each table. We make sure that all the table is set in terms of etiquette and making sure that everybody has their silverware, plates, napkins, cups. The plebes are actually in charge of making sure that this etiquette actually happens. Meals at West Point are full of traditions that the cadets observe, like the plebes pouring water for the upperclassmen. Etiquette is a huge deal in the military, and so this kind of just reinforces from your first year here that etiquette is super important. At the plebe end of the table, every seat has a specific role and responsibility. Typically, you'll have one person at the end, and that's your cold beverage corporal. They will be in charge of making sure that everyone has a cup full of water, because there's water pitchers on the table when you get there. And then there will be a gunner to the left of them at the end of the table. They're in charge of the desserts. And then to the right of the cold beverage corporal is the hot beverage corporal. That person is in charge of getting, if there's soup in the buffet line or like coffee in the mornings. Take seats. And then the plebes will call the table, which means so that they basically say like, the fourth class has performed all their duties and now we're ready to eat. And then at that point, we all start eating our meal. Portion sizes are crucial to ensure each cadet is receiving their daily caloric intake. But some tables in the mess hall receive more than the standard portion. So there's a variety of different cadets here, right, with a variety of different nutrition needs, and they're always doing different levels of, of activity. 
Tables with a heavy designation receive a portion and a half, and tables with a heavy, heavy sign get double portions. For some of the athletes that we have that have to maintain a higher body weight um, for their sport, such as football or heavyweight wrestling or some of our track and field throwers, they require more calories to be able to support that activity as well as keep their body weight in a range to be competitive uh, you know, in their sport. So they may need more calories to support that. Let's go. For cadets, lunch is a mandatory meal. They're all coming here from, from all over the country and, and honestly all over the world because they're exchange students as well. So it's a way to make sure that they can build that camaraderie and build that teammate, you know, build that team together uh, by, by making them have that meal. For upperclassmen, breakfast and some dinners are optional, where they can choose from several other options on campus. Another tradition in Washington Hall, all four years of students sit next to each other for lunch. I love having a table with both freshmen, juniors, seniors. It definitely allows you to interact with people in your company that you normally wouldn't. And we switch tables every semester as well, so we get to build those new relationships with people throughout our four years here. What are some of the favorite meals of the cadets here? So I think probably the most favorite meal and something you'll probably hear a lot is there's a spicy chicken patty that, that the cadets absolutely love. My favorite meal here would probably be either spicy chicken or the sweet and sour chicken with rice. Favorite meal is definitely Crispito, sir. It's like a hot dog burrito, if I had to explain it. I really do like the Taco Tuesdays. I also think they do a very good job with the seafoods. What, what's your least favorite food here? My least favorite food would probably be taco night. Probably the pork chop. I'm not really a big Philly cheesesteak guy. Sometimes they'll get burnt out on eating chicken. You know, it's, there's only so many proteins that we can prepare. Chicken is one of them that really almost everybody eats. So, you know, it's trying to find different ways to, to season the chicken or different ways to prepare the chicken so that, you know, their palate doesn't get burnt out from, from eating the same thing. This is Washington Hall inside the cadet mess area, as we call it. So behind me is the famous mural. The inspiration behind this was by General Douglas MacArthur, class 1903. And in the 1930s, he became chief of staff of the Army. He worked with the academic board here, and they came up with the concept of battles, leaders, commanders, and technology. You'll see Alexander the Great up top with the uh, chariot. You'll see siege uh, rams and so on. All the states are by admission. So you get Arkansas, Texas, Iowa, California, and so on. Behind me is the entrance from the mess hall when it was finished in 1929. So below me, about three or four feet, would be steps, and then the grass area out here. This was the front of the mess hall. So in the early 1960s, the idea was to expand the uh, enrollment of the academy because the Army and the Air Force Academy, which was only a few years old, had an enrollment top of 2,500, where the Naval Academy had 4,000 midshipmen by law. So there's different aspects that occurred, but in 1965, the law was signed and they started uh, building, expanding, so they built out from the original 1929 mess hall this way. So at the end of the meal, normally they'll call upper class rest or brigade rise. And then at that point, everybody can get up and leave. So at that point, meal is ended. It usually only takes like 12 to 15 minutes for everybody to eat. And then we're on our way to our next class. And when is the next class usually start? Our next class starts at 1245. As the cadets begin to leave Washington Hall, the wait staff cleans the tables. And back in the kitchens, the cooks have begun preparing dinner, which is only five and a half hours away. This used to be the only way to make a Domino's pizza. About a dozen workers touched every ball of dough rolling down the production line. But now, in Domino's brand new $50 million facility in Indiana, machines measure, move, and stack pizza dough. 
And more and more, workers touch buttons instead of flour. You just have to kind of watch it, make sure it's doing the right things. All this comes after years of stiff competition from other pizza chains and a struggle to find enough workers, even in the store. Domino's in particular was having a hard time fulfilling these roles that are not super high paying and are pretty strenuous to work. And as sales spike for pizza's biggest holiday, those machines will be put to the test. It's all hands on deck. Super Bowl is one of the, you know, top three busiest days for Domino's Pizza. So how does the world's biggest pizza chain balance automation with the human touch? And what does all this mean for the future of fast food? Each year, Domino's slings out about a billion pizzas globally. They have been one of the most successful public companies since around 2009, 2010. The company can keep pizza cheap because it controls its entire supply chain, from dough making to delivery. In the U.S., it all depends on bustling production and distribution centers. Back in 2018, we filmed at an older center in Connecticut with a more manual dough process. There, it took hours longer to make and chill pizza dough than at Domino's newest and heavily automated Indiana center. Now we have robots, so it's more efficient, it's more consistent. This 110,000 square foot location opened in October 2022 and reportedly cost the company $50 million. We're constantly moving from the second that we start, we're go, go, go. While some centers still measure ingredients by hand, at the new ones, mixing machines pump in flour, water, oil, salt, and sugar directly from storage. And then we have a secret recipe, a uh, prepackaged recipe. I cannot tell you what's in our top secret ingredient because we wouldn't be able to let you go out of here. The new facility can churn out 50 batches of dough a day. That's 88,000 uh, pizzas for our customers daily. Dough has a shelf life to it and we don't, we don't freeze it. We constantly have to make it, so it's, it's nonstop. Workers in this new center mostly control the computers, pull samples for quality control, and troubleshoot any issues with the machines. We don't like to stop. So um, basically, if there's anything that goes on during the day, we're meant to clean out the problems fast, efficiently, and get them going so the line never stops. Workers can program the machine to pop out different sized dough balls for small, medium, or large pizzas. And I just changed that tube out to give us a little bit smaller dough ball. And then robots place the dough balls onto trays. That's another update, as this used to be done by hand. Nine years ago, it was team members that were placing that, so just imagine how hard that was on our team members. This has made it a lot less physical, and we're able to attract a lot more talent. A set of cameras make sure the dough balls don't stick together. It's literally taking micro, like, pictures of it. If it catches any mistakes with our placing, this right here will reject each tray. This machine applies a label to each tray. To identify what kind of dough it was and when it was made. Behold the spiral chiller. About 3,000 feet of conveyor belts can cool 40,000 trays of dough at once. There isn't a cooler bigger than the one that you see behind me. We're able to hold two days worth of production, and that gives us the ability to have dough in case of we need to support other supply chain centers. They don't want to freeze it because then it would stop the dough from proofing, or the rising that happens when yeast is activated. So they chill it down to 38 degrees to slow the proofing process. It's very cold in here. Our trays go up for 30 minutes and they come down for 30 minutes. The dough used to take four hours to cool. Now with the spiral chiller, it takes just one. The dough balls travel down another conveyor belt. Then sensors tell these robots to stack them 25 trays high. A much faster process than the original way of doing it. The machine also slides a dolly cart under each stack to easily move them. This is the end of the line. We double check that each tray got a label, then you push it. Here are six different kinds of dough. Handmade pan, hand-tossed extra large, large, medium, small, and wheat for school lunches await orders from franchises. 
and they have to move fast to prepare for the biggest pizza holiday, the Super Bowl. We normally see a 30% increase, so normally we go from producing half a million uh, dough balls to 750,000 dough balls a week. Noe says with all this automation, the center was able to cut hours off its dough making time. And this production process requires fewer employees, an important feature of the new facility. Because less than a year into the pandemic, Domino's came face to face with a labor crisis gripping the entire food industry. By early 2021, the U.S. restaurant industry was down 1.2 million workers. And there were lots of reasons why. Some workers retired, some quit, some trained for jobs in other sectors, and some relied on unemployment benefits. Employees left warehouse and delivery jobs at record rates. Domino's in particular was having a hard time fulfilling these roles that are not super high paying and are pretty strenuous to work. Warehouse conditions can be tough. In the summertime, this uh, dry, dry warehouse area, it can get super hot. Um, we do have fans and we have other things to keep people cool uh, and hydrated, but it can get super hot. That's where they keep the pizza sauce, dipping cups, barbecue sauce, pizza boxes, and the world's most controversial topping. Pineapple, um, for all those pineapple pizza lovers. The one area that we're looking into right here is our freezer, which is below zero in temperature. This freezer stores the cheese, all the meat toppings and chicken wings. The veggie freezer holds just that, mushrooms, onions and peppers, and a cooler stores the pepperoni. Staffing has been a, a real challenge across, again, the whole industry. So it's this kind of vicious cycle. When you can't hire enough people, it creates a lot of different problems throughout the business. So here in Indiana, Domino's implemented new processes to make warehouse and delivery jobs easier on employees' bodies. At older centers, goods would be bulk loaded onto trucks. So when drivers got to franchises, they had a mini grocery store and would pick out ingredients from each shop. But at the new centers, Domino's has added a whole picking team. They grab all the ingredients and load them into cages. Each store gets its own cage. Which is just efficient and faster and easier. The wheels on these carts make it so smooth to go in and out. So when the drivers pull up, the pre-picked loads are waiting for them. This is where we do stage all of our product for loading. Workers move all the rolling cages and dough dollies onto 48-foot refrigerated trucks. We come in and we place the carts in from left to right, just into the truck. We'll strap it every five rows or so to give it a support brace to hold everything in tight. We're heavily strapped in. It goes a long way to get the pizza to you. On average, 13 stores worth of goods can fit in just one truck. We do a lot of things that are kind of like Tetris here. The center dispatches about 28 trailers. They supply over 300 stores across five states. Domino's wanted the new center to take the load off older supply chain centers. All those centers were over capacity. Most drivers are dispatched overnight to avoid traffic and crowded parking lots. We actually just left the center. We're heading out to uh, one of the franchisee stores, going to make their delivery. Uh, my wife laughs at me every time because when I go to Parallel Park, my car, she's like, why are you putting it up so much? I'm like, because I drive the truck more than I drive my car. And, and I got a little bitty car too. <laughs> so you could just imagine how many wide turns I'm doing in my little bitty car. When, when, the, when the coronavirus hit, uh, a lot of people weren't coming out. They got so bad, Domino's launched a program to send employees from anywhere else in the company to driving school. We're arriving now. The store's right here on the left-hand side. Uh, it has a store number, the stop number, so it's very easy to to know what store is getting what. So these are dough trays. We take the old ones, bring the new ones in. So it's, it's just a cycle. The new picking and caging systems have taken some of the physical stress off truckers. Now everything's pre-picked. So they've, they've really made our job 100% uh, easier 
and better and safer as well. Our on-time status has is, is, is improved a lot as far as the delays. We're only at a store 15 minutes versus an hour. So was all of Domino's investment in new tech worth it? Fast food correspondent Kate Taylor says yes. It is working, kind of. All of these solutions they found are working pretty well. And at this point, the labor shortage is kind of abetting a little bit. And Domino's has held on to its title of the biggest pizza chain in the world. It's nearly doubled its global store count in the last decade and passed Pizza Hut in sales in 2018. Domino's was basically able to steal a bunch of Pizza Hut customers. But what does all this automation mean for the future of human jobs in fast food? Automation is no longer an if, it's a when for fast food. There's definitely money to be made in using robots instead of humans. And Domino's is not alone. White Castle already uses robots on some fry stations, and Jack in the Box is soon to follow. Robots are popping up in some KFCs and are set to start cooking chicken. And McDonald's is testing AI to take drive through orders. Domino's itself has trialed self-driving cars to deliver pizza. If there is a robot that can do something for a lower price point than hiring people to do it, companies are gonna jump on that. Which leads to the age-old concern. Could robots take people's jobs? I personally don't think automating is an evil move. I think it's a bit more nuanced than that. Kate says some of the lost jobs are actually okay to lose. Stacking boxes again and again and again, it can lead to injuries. Automating jobs that are repetitive, that are dangerous for workers, that are even just straight boring, that allows people to have the opportunity to have better jobs at a company. And I think that that's also something that shouldn't be villainized. What hasn't become robotic is Domino's in-store experience. You can't automate everything. Making the pizza will stay human. The company does have that hand-tossed slogan to live up to. Pizza chefs pull the proof dough out of the fridge and still make every pie by hand. We're gonna start with some fresh dough. Pull it out there, stick it in the cornmeal. You wanna make sure you make a pencil rim. Reduces the air in the dough. Jessica ladles on a thin layer of tomato sauce. Next, you move on to the cheesing phase. You wanna, you wanna make sure you stay away from the middle. At all, even amounts. She so drops on about 40 slices of pepperoni for a large pizza. It goes through the oven, takes about six and a half minutes, and then it'll come out on the other side. A squeeze of garlic oil on the crust finishes off the pie. And then you close the box. And it's all complete. But just because there aren't any robots tossing pizza doesn't mean there isn't a hustle. Ready, set, go! It's important to go fast, I think, um, for the customer aspect, because when they're placing an order, um, they're hungry. You know, every pizza is a rush. Fastest pizza I've ever made is a large pepperoni in 25 seconds. It's all hands on deck. Super Bowl is one of the, you know, top three busiest days for Domino's Pizza. And uh, before you ask, 59% of customers are gonna order pepperoni. And stores like this one haven't been spared from the worst of the labor crunch. Now, there are challenges with staffing, uh, retention. There is the competition of, you know, all those other uh, delivery businesses that want to take our drivers. At the very end of the process, the hot pies finally head out for delivery. Today, still by humans and fleets of electric cars. But maybe tomorrow? And driverless ones. We're going to keep trucking the product to to our customers and get it done. This company hauls in 60,000 pounds of crawfish a day. Once they're out of the water, the clock starts ticking. Farmers have just a few hours to get them weighed, sold, and into coolers, and these little guys have to stay alive the whole time. 
As soon as they're dead, it starts breaking them down extremely fast. Yeah, it'll get mushy and spoiled. These crustaceans are big business for Louisiana. They contribute $300 million to the state's economy and end up across the U.S. Do you ever sneak a bite? But you can't help yourself, especially when they're hot. But this industry didn't even take off until recent decades. In the 80s, some rice farmers took a massive gamble. They experimented with cultivating the crawfish that lived below their fields. And it paid off. In just nine years, Madison McIntyre has built one of the biggest crawfish companies in the state, handling up to four million pounds a year. Never imagined that it would be to this level, nor was it our goal. It kind of just happened organically. But because the farmed crawfish industry is so young, it's like the Wild West, unregulated and fast moving. So how exactly did Louisiana's rice farmers come to harvest crawfish? And why do they stay in such a tough business? Crawfish are freshwater crustaceans, related to lobsters and shrimp. And they're native to Louisiana's bayous, rivers, swamps, and rice fields, like this one. And if you look closely, you'll see some holes. There's one right here. They go by all sorts of names. Crawdads, crayfish, mud bugs. They come out the mud, literally. From late September to October, rice farmers flood their fields, and the crawfish emerge from their burrows hungry. By November, he can start catching them in rows of traps. Mauricio Guillen, nicknamed Junior, heads out on the crawfish boat, which doesn't have a steering wheel. And all that's controlled by foot pedals that are at his feet. Armed with thick gloves, he empties each trap. He has just seven seconds to dump out a trap, load in more bait, and drop it back in the water. And that's just how much ground it covers between each trap. He's got to move quickly so the crawfish don't die in the Louisiana heat. Junior's pretty fast. He's a lot faster than me. This table helps them weed out any unwanted critters. And it separates the crawfish by size. The smaller peelers can fall through here. You know, they'll go from underneath here and then into these sacks. But crawfish's big break didn't even come until the 1980s. Rice farmers' profits were dipping. So looking for another income stream, they took a big risk and cultivated crawfish alongside the grain. Fourth generation rice farmer Jim Johnson was one of them. It just works almost perfect together. There's almost no better combination of vegetation to go with crawfish. The rice plant provides a wetland for crawfish breeding and shade from the sun, and plays host to microorganisms like algae, larvae, and worms. The crawfish will feed off of those. The crawfish's poop then fertilizes the field, and the two crop seasons line up perfectly. When farmers harvest the rice, the crawfish have safely burrowed themselves deep into the mud. Once the rice is picked, crawfish emerge from their burrows with babies. By winter, they're ready to be harvested and eaten. Soon, buyers all over the South, from Texas to South Carolina, began gobbling up the mud bugs. What was once just a local eat now makes up more than half of Jim's business. And with declining margins in the rice industry through the years, the crawfish not only supplemented it, but helped agriculture thrive. Today, the crops are an important part of economies like Welsh Louisiana's. All the crawfish in the whole nation are farmed in a 35-mile square radius of this area. From November to July, rice farmers end up with tons of crawfish, <laughs> packed into sacks like these. Junior and his team will load them onto trucks and book it to the crawfish dock. In the summer months, they have to get the mud bugs weighed and in the cooler within three hours, or else the heat could kill them. And dead crawfish breed bacteria. Once cooked, it's technically still edible, but the meat falls apart and it doesn't taste as good. Madison pays rice farmers about $1.25 a pound for their catch. Unlike most crawfish mongers, he doesn't come from a farming family. In 2014, he and his friend Charlie started selling them out of his truck in New Orleans. At an abandoned gas station, and we would, we would do serve boiled crawfish through there on the weekend. It was so successful, he bought more trucks and expanded into a full-fledged enterprise, Parish Seafood Wholesale. While a lot of crawfish companies focus on just one part of the process, Madison does it all, along with his dog, June. 
He grows his own crawfish and buys from 36 other rice farmers. He also owns a company that hauls the catch, a processing plant, and restaurants, cutting out the middlemen. Now we have a little over 60 employees. Um, we run 14 trucks, seven days a week, 24-7. Um, Madison washes some of his catch on this $150,000 machine. How many times have you gotten caught by crawfish? Every day, every day, yeah, but you get used to it. Like, it doesn't really hurt. Not only do they have to watch their fingers, they have to watch out for runaways. And they're escape artists, so yeah. Crawfish have to hit the coolers right after washing to keep them alive until they're sold. Madison tries to move the high-grade larger crawfish within 12 to 24 hours, but that's not always easy. It's all, it's all pretty much done on a handshake. There's no contracts. You have to be careful because people can buy all of your crawfish at the beginning of the season, and then as soon as the catch picks up, they can, be, they can leave you and buy from somebody else. Stranding crawfish in these fridges. It can be a lot of pressure. The low-grade smaller crawfish are easier for him to move because Madison just sells it to himself. Then he sends it to his Bro Bridge factory to process the tail meat. Workers start unloading the crawfish off the trucks starting at 4 a.m. They dump them into tanks and skim off any dead or weak ones from the top. Then they give the mud bugs a wash. A conveyor belt drops them into a giant steamer basket. Using a system of tracks, a worker carefully lowers the basket into a vat of boiling water. Just like lobsters, crawfish go in alive to get the best flavor. That's why it's so important to keep them kicking until this moment. It takes just two minutes to cook them through. Then Madison and the team break them down this steel table into the peeling room. Leona Williams has been peeling here for 50 years. Learned this from mama at the age of 13. Get off of school, help out mom. Sometimes until one in the morning. So you break the head off, and then you pinch the tail. This is the meat. Peel them well to make sure that the veins are out for sure. She can peel about 40 pounds worth a day. And you gotta be kind of fast at it. That's about the only way you could make money. They get paid two fifty a pound. Are you the fastest one here? Uh, no, I'm not gonna say this. I have my sister right here. She's a little faster than I am. The team in the next room vacuum seals the tails into one pound bags. Because competition is so stiff, Madison wouldn't tell us where he sells these, but he said they end up across the U.S. He also sends tail meat and whole crawfish to three restaurants he owns in the state cooking up all kinds of Louisiana delicacies. Crawfish have been an important part of Southern Louisiana's culture for centuries. According to the Native Heritage Project, the Homa indigenous people named themselves after the word for crawfish and used it as a war symbol. In the 1800s, a wave of French Canadians settled in Louisiana after being forced out of Canada by the British. They came to be known as the Cajuns, and they brought their lobster recipes with them. But short on lobster here, they swapped in crawfish. By the 1960s, crawfish had their own festival, and Creole restaurants were adding them to menus in New Orleans. It was definitely um, a Louisiana delicacy. It didn't really get much farther than the state. Crawfish have since gone definitively national, but locals still cook them into staples, like etouffee, bodan, and boils. Madison's business partner, Charlie Johnson, uses a Cajun cooking style in his crawfish boils. Make sure the drain's shut. This is liquid boil. Um, so I'm adding that to the water. He first boils the corn and potatoes, drains them, and then cooks the crawfish last. Right there, when the tail starts to kind of separate from the head, there's that little white line. You can see the meat. That's usually a telltale sign that they're, they're ready. While New Orleans Creole chefs add dry seasoning to the water crawfish boil in, out here, Cajuns dump on the dry seasoning after they're cooked. We shut that ice chest and we let them steam. I think the magic happens in the ice chest. That's when they start to soak up those seasonings. 
down here, folks stop by the restaurant well into the evening. The Cajuns also love their dip. While back in Nola, they don't use any sauce. Probably the most out of all of us. Yeah. <laughs> With his factory, waste station, and restaurants, Madison has become a considerable player in the crawfish industry. We're building a new facility that's going to be focused on air freight crawfish. But his success hasn't come without its challenges. As the industry boomed over the last 20 years, lots of people tried to get in on the action. By 2019, the number of crawfish farms in the state had doubled. And then came inflation. Madison says costs soared to 40%. Last year, fuel alone cost him $150,000 more than normal. That's a lot of money that would have been profit. Yeah, labor's pretty high and we have mostly foreign labor. 95% of his staff is working in the U.S. on a visa. And we also have to house them and pay for transportation. You can't find local or American labor that would work as hard as these guys do side by side with us. Madison says he pays them just under $14 an hour, almost double the minimum wage. We'll put in 15 and 18 hour days, seven days a week. So it's very demanding. We don't get to see our family as much during the season, but they don't get to see their family at all. Soaring operation costs and low margins have forced dozens of Louisiana crawfish companies to close. And so the people that came in just to, for the, the get quick rich scheme are not making it right now because of how tough the market is. Madison says the size of his company has helped keep him afloat. You know, we could absorb that those blows, but a lot of people unfortunately couldn't. What big changes have you made to, to make it through this kind of uh, We don't get big salaries. Madison said Parish Seafood Wholesale saw $500,000 in profit last year, and he paid himself just a $20,000 salary. He also says he invested more than 80% of the profit back into the company. So if anything ever breaks or if coolers go out, we have backup everything. You know, backup trucks, backup ice machines, backup freezers, backup coolers. We have multiple forklifts, which are all just luxuries. Because in an industry where one bad season could send a company packing, Madison has to fight to keep each crawfish alive. I think, you know, in the next five or six years, it'll be very lucrative again to be in this industry because there'll only be a handful of people doing it. <clears throat> Where's that? These cooks are grilling 4,200 beef tenderloin steaks at the U.S. Air Force Academy's 225,000 square foot dining hall near Colorado Springs, Colorado. And that's just for dinner. Over the course of three meals, the staff at Mitchell Hall will make 590 pounds of hash browns, 375 pounds of eggs, and 90 pounds of bacon for breakfast. Lunch will require an additional 127 pounds of bacon, 1,700 pounds of waffle fries, and 5,400 burger patties. On any given day, the cooks here are preparing 10,000 meals. This is the biggest dining facility I've ever worked in. You look at 430 tables, family style, and you got a starch, a meat, and a vegetable. You're looking at about 1,300 pans of food that are going on the table on a daily basis for lunch here. But feeding 4,000 Air Force cadets isn't the same as feeding your average college student. Their energy needs are quite high compared to the average person, where most people are trying to eat like 2,000 calories. These kids, I want them eating like much, much more than that and consistently throughout the day. And on top of the bigger calorie count, yeah! lunch comes with a set of Air Force traditions three days a week. We got to see how one of the military's largest dining facilities cooks massive quantities of food across three different meals. Mitchell Hall has an annual budget of $20 million. In 2022, the dining facility purchased 546,000 pounds of meat, 1.2 million pounds of produce, and 21,000 gallons of milk which were served across 3.5 million meals. Today's dinner is not just any meal. 
It's the Cadet Wings Recognition Dinner. Recognition is a three-day event where the freshman class is put through many stressful uh, events to test their mental and physical stamina. Once you make it to recognition dinner, it's a sense of accomplishment. The freshman class is recognized as a fully qualified members of the Cadet Wing. To celebrate, the staff is preparing 4,000 steaks, 1,600 pounds of tortellini, and 788 pounds of orange glazed carrots. The first steak hits the grill at one o'clock to ensure the meal is ready on time, five hours before dinner is served. The steaks move in an assembly line fashion. They're removed from their packaging, then placed on the grill where they're seasoned and then cooked. They're then moved into a pan, wrapped, and wheeled away to be stored in hot carts to keep them warm until dinner. At the other end of the kitchen, the pre-made pasta is poured into pans, topped with pesto parmesan alfredo sauce, and moved into a rotating oven to cook. Preparing this much food requires an incredible amount of organization, but not just today. A meal like this is planned out more than a month in advance. We really want to work six to eight weeks ahead and commit, we call it committing, our menu for that far in advance. And sometimes we'll find that in eight weeks there's a holiday meal, so we need to make special preparations and changes to the menu for any special events that might be coming up. And the recognition dinner is one of the most special meals of the year. In the front of the house, the dining area is prepped for the cadets. Back in the kitchen, onions, carrots, and mushrooms are cooked with a medley of seasonings for the vegetarian beef stew, while the rest of the staff strains 788 pounds of vegetables and moves them into hot carts for dinner service. As cadets begin filing into the dining hall, freshmen, known as fourth-year cadets, typically have to pass out plates and silverware for the table. After that, the fourth years read and study the Air Force Academy handbook, known as contrails, as they wait to be seated while upperclassmen quiz them. Tonight, the fourth years become fully recognized members of the cadet wing and will no longer have to perform these duties. So during the year of freshman year, we're required to come in here and after everything's set up, we have to hold our contrails at the position of attention and study them. So they make us do this, A, to form discipline because we're standing at attention, holding our arms up. So on Saturday night, it's a fun tradition to come in and have your upperclassmen do that with random objects. And then you can ask them questions like they would with us, with our knowledge. We're like yelling at them in a fun manner, and it's just a really cool experience tradition that we do. Before dinner ends, the wait staff brings out Mitch's Mountains, a dessert made earlier in the week by upperclassmen, just for today's occasion. The Mitch's workers came in and they brought us these boxes and we're like, oh, what's that? And then they open them and it's just this pile of dessert. And so it's pound cake on the bottom topped with a bunch of scoops of ice creams and whipped cream and cherries and American flags on top to celebrate our country. And so that was one of the cool experiences for us as freshmen. After the meal, the staff in charge of the recognition dinner head home. In just eight hours, a fresh team of cooks will arrive to prepare the next meal. Good morning. Good morning. Our head count for today has gone back down. We had to increase because of the weekend for recognition. So breakfast, we have scrambled eggs, bacon, and the roundabout hash browns. Let's have a good shift. Help this morning, the cooks only have two and a half hours to prepare breakfast for 1,500 students. It's a smaller meal because unlike most lunches during the week, cadets aren't required to attend but it's still a challenge to finish on time. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have right now is making sure that we have enough staff on hand to make sure that the job gets done on a daily basis. We are open seven days a week, and we do serve three meals per day, so the work never stops. Like many other kitchens, Mitchell Hall is still recovering from a staffing shortage caused by the pandemic. The eight cooks on staff for this meal boil 375 pounds of pre-cooked scrambled eggs, heat up 90 pounds of bacon, 
and cook 560 pounds of hash browns in an industrial-sized fryer known as the Monster. As our, our staffing dwindled, uh, we've had to go to a lot of pre-done convenience items. For instance, bone bag mashed potatoes, bone bag mac and cheese. It's a very time-saving opportunity for us with the short staff that we have. It's a proven method for serving large quantities of nutritious food with only a handful of cooks. The staff will spend the majority of their time transferring breakfast items into pans, where they will be set on the serving line for cadets to grab and go or dine in. But just as breakfast is being served, lunch prep is already underway. So lunch today, the cadets are getting what we call the California burger. They're getting waffle fries today. Again, they get run through our, our monster deep fryer as well. And we got the lettuce, tomato, onion kits that come in fresh, and uh, those get placed on the table as well. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there's no room for error in preparing the lunch meal. All 4,000 cadets are required to dine in at Mitchell Hall, and they're only given 20 minutes to eat there's only about uh, a 30 minute window that they have between classes. Then right after that, they're going to another class of military training. So there's only a small window built in for them to eat in Mitchell Hall. That limits their options. We can't provide endless options in a meal like that. So they do get their one main option. We usually have a lean protein option for them. And then we have a vegetarian option and that's it. We're at like a traditional college. You're gonna go in and you're gonna have different types of cuisines available. We don't have that necessarily here. I think it's just the scale that we serve on is the biggest difference in um, how we provide food to our kids. Prepping the burger patties for 4,000 cadets takes about four hours. Cooks start by laying out the pre-cooked patties on a tray before moving them into the oven to heat up. In another part of the kitchen, cooks work together to feed 1,700 pounds of waffle fries into the deep fryer conveyor belt. As the fries exit, they are immediately put into pans that are later loaded into hot carts. Meanwhile, Vegetables are boiled and seasoned in two 100-gallon kettles. So what we have here is our 100-gallon steam-jacketed kettles. Uh, we cook uh, a very diverse amount of product through here. Right now we're doing Italian vegetables. That's one of the vegetables for lunch service today. Typically on veg, we'll do about 200 pounds worth of vegetables for a lunch service. On the lower level of the kitchen, staff works to wash, chop, and pack fruits and vegetables for meals planned later in the week. Prepping food days in advance allows staff to seamlessly serve thousands of required meals. There's a buffalo chicken wrap, buffalo chicken tenders for vegetarians, waffle fries. But even more crucial to their efficiency is planning the menu weeks in advance and storing the meals in the dining facility's 20,000 square foot warehouse. When we are ordering foods, that order goes in all at the same time for the whole week. They get put into a category, and depending on that category is the day that they arrive. Once everything comes up the elevator, we'll separate it and take it to wherever it needs to be. We have four storage departments, the warehouse, the freezer, meat, and dairy. While the warehouse staff takes inventory and stocks next week's food, the kitchen staff is wrapping up lunch, moving the last few batches of food onto warming trays. Outside, cadets get into formation for the dine-in lunch, which is mandatory three days a week. The Air Force Academy band begins playing as the cadet wing marches toward Mitchell Hall. 2,500 men in the making march en masse to mess for meals like mother never made. Since the Air Force Academy was established in 1954, cadets have been required to march into lunch. Once inside, 
fourth years set the table and serve the food. We set out all the plates, we set out forks, knives, and spoons if they're needed. I was at the position called the cold pilot. I pour the waters and set that all for the table. And then the person next to him is called the hot pilot, which he would get all the food ready, everything, the meat, the vegetables, and the carbs. He would set that for each freshman and every upperclassman. Today is the freshman class's first lunch since recognition where those responsibilities no longer fall on them. They dine like the rest of the cadet wing. It is impossible to meet 4,000 cadets' nutritional needs and food likes and dislikes. And so really it's working on them on an individual basis, um, just emphasizing the importance of regular eating and how that affects both their, not only their academic performance, but their physical performance as well. The Air Force Academy follows the nutrition standards outlined by the U.S. military, which requires its most active members to eat up to 4,700 calories a day for men and 3,000 a day for women. Mitchell Hall provides as much as 5,000 calories in a day, not including food from Falcon Express, the grab-and-go station inside the dining hall. I order every single item that goes into there, so I try to balance it out too with um, things that are good and healthy for them that provide a lot of energy and nutrition um, with some fun things as well like Cracker Jacks and potato chips and stuff like that. At 1215, lunch comes to an end. Cadets clear their tables and head to their next class. The wait staff begins cleaning the tables and resetting the dining area. Back in the kitchen, the cooking staff starts prepping for dinner, which will be served in five hours. This is what Tabasco's original red sauce looks like years before it arrives at grocery stores. It starts here, aging inside these barrels in southern Louisiana. It takes five years to make a bottle of Tabasco sauce. It's a long time. And the recipe inside hasn't changed since 1868. Red peppers, vinegar, and salt. And even as the company's grown, it's managed to keep much of the production inside its headquarters on Avery Island. But Tabasco's storied home is now under threat. The factory is surrounded by shrinking marshes, making it vulnerable to hurricanes. And the company has spent millions on storm protection. It changes drastic from storm to storm. You can see the, the marsh deteriorating. Uh, what you do is you get out there and you, you plan again. You try and hold what you got. We head to southern Louisiana to see how the sixth generation of the McElhenney family is fighting for the survival of its hot sauce and home. Tabasco grows peppers just for seeds inside this greenhouse. We're also looking for the plants that produce the richest color red peppers at perfect size, and then flavor too. Christian Brown is the great-great-great-grandson of founder Edmund McElhenney and the company's agriculture manager. Yeah, everything's looking good, no signs of aphids. He sends only the strongest seeds to over a thousand Tabasco farms around the world. Tabasco says their peppers originate from the Amazon in South America. They're about six times hotter than a jalapeno, and they're tiny, only one to one and a half inches long and weighing a gram each. Because the peppers are so small and easily damaged, machines don't do the harvesting. They're all hand-picked. Tabasco harvests 10 million pounds of peppers a year. This footage is from Louisiana, but the process looks similar abroad. They sprinkle salt on the peppers and use a giant machine to mash them into a paste. Farms ship the paste back to Avery Island through the port of New Orleans. This mash is actually from Peru. We have 50,000 pounds of Tabasco mash inside that container bulked in. This pump siphons the paste into white oak barrels. Some are 60 years old. Most of these barrels in here are essentially a used bourbon barrel. I don't really have the answer. 
I know it works and we've been doing it 150 plus years so I'm not changing it. A team works together to fill and seal each one. One truckload will fill up to 110 barrels, but they can't overfill them because... If you have too much pressure, sometimes those caps blow off. Sometimes the lids will pop off overnight. It's a really simple fix. Just kind of move it to the barrel next to it. It can take 30 minutes to finish one row. Since they're old, the barrels don't have a perfect seal. So workers pour salt on top. It lets gases escape while limiting oxidation. Salt on top is, is just an extra protective layer. There is an imperfection that will help. The team stacks each barrel by mash origin. So this whole bay here, going as far back to, as you can to get to the wall, is, is about 1,100 barrels of Columbia 2022. The mash releases lots of gases during fermentation, so a tiny valve on top helps relieve the pressure. You have to have some ventilation process or it's going to explode. And that happens sometimes. It's like a Tabasco ghost. They come in here at night and they pop the lids off and we come back and there's six or seven we have to fix. After three years, the mash inside will stabilize, shrink, and darken in color. We can see that it was filled to about this level here. And you can start to see rings on the side of that barrel where the mash is going down. Even though it's shrunk, the aged mash is still really spicy. No coffee? Not yet, not yet, but it is hot. So let's remember, this is 10 times more hot than actual sauce. Next up, the aged mash is pumped into the blending room. Here, the pepper smell will hit you right in the back of the throat. I could say like getting maced, I guess, every day. It can really hit you hard. But that's how I put my kids through college, so I'm, I'm good with that. I, I love it. Morris Montgomery oversees blending, but he goes by Nook. The Army veteran ensures all the sauce tastes the same, even though it's coming from around the world. I try to do it three or four different countries and put them together. So it could be like a little Colombia, Peru, and a little Ecuador and Honduras. He pumps in vinegar and blends it all for up to 28 days. 72 tanks mix at the same time. Strainers remove pepper pulp and seeds. Nook will take a sample for the lab to test for pH, and then... This is finished Tabasco sauce, and this is ready to go. Uh, next step to the bottling floor. That's where John Simmons comes in. And I'm also a member of the sixth generation of the McElhinney family to make Tabasco sauce. John's factory fills up to 700,000 bottles every day, from minis to the iconic five ounce one. It also pumps out nine different flavors, from original red to habanero. Sriracha is the company's fastest growing one. Today, machines do most of the filling, capping, and labeling. So a bottle is gonna go through in about 13 minutes. They gather the bottles and package them into cardboard boxes. We're doing it really fast at like 300 bottles a minute. Next, the shipping room. So we've got product for Germany, Japan, Sweden, Taiwan, the Canary Islands, South Africa. Typically, all these newly packaged products leave the warehouse within three weeks. While the sauce is definitively global, Avery Island has always been home. This was where founder and former banker Edmund McElhenney first grew the tiny red peppers. He bottled his first hot sauce in 1868, sealed it with wax, and sold just under 700 bottles around the Gulf Coast. Each one cost a dollar. He named the brand Tabasco, after the Mexican state known for spice production and exports. Edmund got a patent for it, and by the early 1870s was selling his bottles across the U.S. and even in Europe. And then it kind of started to take a little steam and get bigger and bigger. In one 24-hour period, we're going to double and then some more of what Edmund did in his entire life. Edmund lived on Avery Island, which is a natural salt dome rising 163 feet above sea level. 
As the highest point along the U.S. Gulf Coast, it's been a respite from raging hurricanes for the McElhenney descendants that still call the island home. But it's now at risk. Louisiana's coast sinks by an average of a third of an inch per year. On average, between 1985 and 2010, the state lost roughly a football field of wetlands every hour. When land sinks, it's more vulnerable to storm damage. It changes drastic from storm to storm, depending where it makes landfall at. Um, you, can, you can see the, the marsh deteriorate. Heath Romero is Avery Island's land manager. He said when Hurricane Rita hit in 2005, it turned this island into a lake and parts of the marsh were destroyed. After Rita, the company built an 18-foot levee with a pump system around the factory. If we put in uh, water control structures to stop the salt water from getting to the cypress trees. They also planted tall grasses for protection. And you can see we, we recovered all of this marsh that was open water at one time. But it's a slow moving process, especially as the home of Tabasco enters another hurricane season. You can't wait for, for, for somebody else to help you. You, you. you have to take action in your own self and try and, try and protect what you have. 